Chair Powell, you can go ahead and start. We are live. Okay, thank you. So good morning to one and all. I um, call to order the September 2020 meeting of the Board of Regents. Um, I wanna thank uh, all of you who are joining us via the live stream video and those attending in the boardroom uh, on the Twin Cities campus. <clears throat> As the COVID-19 pandemic uh, continues to shape our daily lives, we're finding new ways to do our work. Uh, like many of our students, faculty and staff, we're, we're now working in a hybrid uh, model and I anticipate we'll continue to hold our meetings uh, in this way for the foreseeable future. And what that means is that while most of us uh, continue to be connected virtually today, uh, we have had over the last uh, day and today, uh, several regents uh, in the boardroom. We have one regent there today and other guests who are participating from the boardroom. Mm -hmm. uh, in this hybrid format, a protocol is much the same as our previous electronic meetings. So just a few reminders. We will continue to keep everyone muted to reduce background noise. Uh, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, uh, please use the raise hand feature uh, within Zoom uh, or contact uh, uh, Mr. Steves, but raise hand has been working pretty well. Uh, and uh, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll have a speaker's list uh, that we'll keep. But when I call you, please unmute yourself. Uh, as ever, uh, all votes will be recorded by roll call as required by the <laughs> open meeting law. Um, <clears throat> I just want to note that uh, we do have a full agenda today. Um, I will look for an opportunity to take a break uh, somewhere uh, in the middle. Uh, and if uh, I lose uh, track of that, uh, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to give me a reminder. We will take a break. And then finally, uh, I'll remind everybody that today's meeting is live streamed and it will be archived on our website for later viewing. And with that, uh, we will turn to our agenda. The first item <coughs> is approval of minutes from our July and August meetings. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Well, second. Motion and second. second. Heard a second. It has been moved and seconded. We'll turn to discussion. Uh, again, use the raise hand feature if you uh, wish to speak or have any comments uh, on the minutes. I don't, I don't see any comments uh, from my screen, Mr. Steves. Anybody with a hand raised? No, Mr. Chair. All right, then uh, we'll call the roll uh, on the minutes. On approval of the minutes. Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and none opposed. All right, thank you, Mr. Steves. So 12 to zero, the minutes are approved. Uh, next, we'll hear the report of the president. Uh, president Gable, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Sviggum, members of the board. I hope that you and yours are healthy, safe, and well. Um, I would like to begin by recognizing that it is September 11th. And I know we all on this day think about where we were and use that memory um, to reflect and also to honor and make sure we never forget the tragic lives lost and the tremendous service that um, many of our first responders offered on that terrible day. I was watching my then toddler son take a swimming lesson and I was six weeks away from delivering my youngest son both of whom are now grown and I had the great blessing of see become tremendous men. And uh, I was with my father who actually worked for many years in tower two of the World Trade Center. 
Um, and in that dark hour, we were shocked as everyone was, but we also witnessed over those few days and weeks, and then since in these 19 years, our capacity to lift and serve others and to hope and to know that we are resilient and that we as a society consistently emerge stronger from tragedy. We find that very comforting in the, in the sad way one finds silver lining amidst very somber clouds um, as we go through the very difficult times that we're in today. Members of the board, over the last six months, we've taken important, difficult, and transformational steps during this difficult time to address the COVID-19 pandemic and also to do everything possible to ensure that we emerge stronger, as we've seen happen before. In particular, with the board's approval, we made the decision at the August 24th special board meeting to delay for two weeks the start of most in-person classes and the move-in of our students to our residence halls on the Duluth Twin Cities and Rochester campuses. We knew that taking a brief pause to learn from the challenges of our peers around the country as students return to their campuses would allow the university to adjust its approach once again, a graceful pivot as, we, as we've come to call them, to mitigate the transmission of the virus and to provide a higher level of safety for our students, faculty and staff. Also enrollment at Duluth, Rochester and the Twin Cities has held fairly steady during this pause there have been fiscal challenges that we were asked about yesterday. We'll report on those in more detail once all of the dust settles. But the um, um, overarching understanding, as difficult as it was, was that this was a, a decision necessary in order for us to ensure that the remainder of the semester remained one anchored in a plan that prioritized safety in ways that we felt confident that we could implement. Members of the board, on September 1st, I briefed uh, virtually um, the Minnesota Senate Higher Education Committee um, and highlighted this and other aspects of the way the university has prepared for the fall semester. We've developed a path that allows us to adapt our extensive plans that started back in March and evolved over the summer to offer a return to on-campus life while prioritizing safety and mitigating the spread of the virus. As referenced during the board's mission committee meeting yesterday, our maroon and gold sunrise plan utilizes a stepped process to allow us to come back to serve our students and our mission, all the while ensuring everything that we understand about safety is implemented and is the first priority in all of our decisions. So this sunrise plan is taking effect across the system in slightly different ways, in some cases in fairly different ways, as we started to highlight yesterday with some of the Q&A that came up during mission fulfillment to understand that each campus, while part of the system is different in the environment uh, on campus, in the communities in which they serve and what that means in terms of the mitigation of the spread of the virus. So for example, at Crookston, things are going well as they near the end of the third week of classes. Crookston currently has no students isolated in its residence halls um, and they are less than 5% at quarantine. These are well below the plan parameters and that's allowed the administration to move back the campus um, stay at home from 9 p.m. to midnight. So they're now on a midnight stay at home or return to home status and we'll reevaluate that measure in two weeks time. In Duluth, move-in has started. It's going well and smoothly. They've had no problems. Um, they've checked in approximately um, over 1100, just over 1100 students which is half of their total occupancy at 2,200, the remainder in the process of moving in now. Um, they'll move in three to 400 students a day until Sunday. And they've had great compliance across the board with social distancing, mask wearing, and other expectations um, put in place in order to have this step of the process go smoothly. At Morris, we're in the fourth week of the semester. Over 80% of students continue to attend at least one face-to-face -face or blended course. Lots of creativity in instructional delivery. So for example, their choir program is holding outdoor rehearsals while the weather still allows with socially distanced community members bringing their lawn chairs for what have become free concerts in the park for the entire community to enjoy. At Rochester, they have, as you know, a record size incoming class. They've completed their virtual new student orientation. Online classes have started and move in is scheduled for September 18th to the 20th. Olmstead County Public Health is working closely with the UMR COVID care team to provide comprehensive support as Rochester's health focused students 
use the pandemic as their case study for the year and probably for future years as well. Members of the board, we recognize these important steps taken across our system and in recognition of the many steps we still have ahead of us are underway, but I wanna make sure to thank so many people who are involved in the planning to make these steps uh, move smoothly. Um, in particular, I wanna highlight the Emergency Management Policy Committee that meets multiple times a week in order to um, make sure that we have representative voice on how we make these decisions and how we implement on these decisions. It's an enormous time commitment from everybody involved, but it is um, the absolute um, source of everything good that has come out of the decision-making process that we've been reporting to you along the way. As many of you have seen, a lot of the decisions that we've made have seemed very conservative as we've brought them to your attention and implemented them. But a lot of higher ed across the country is migrating to where we are. I'd like to think we were skating to where the puck was going to be. Some of that remains to be seen. We offer humbly that there is still a lot that we don't know and that we will still have graceful pivots as we've come to call them as the fall unfolds. But we are managing these delays. Uh, the hybrid coursework is underway. Lots of different universities are using stay at home or be home by standards in two week increments. There's a lot of emerging best practice and the University of Minnesota system has been at the center of that. We will still experience challenges. We will have cases as students start to return. But our university family can be assured that every decision was grounded in the standard of being as safe as any place else, offering flexibility so that those who need to make decisions that are in the best interest of their own health and safety or their families can do so. And that we recognize that every student, every faculty member, every staff member, and ultimately the legacy of this institution is grounded in making these decisions around safety with an inclusive voice and shared governance, all of which comes together to make us stronger. Members of the board in the spirit of inclusion and this commitment to shared governance, I wanna give you a few other updates, in particular, um, how we continue to process George Floyd's tragic death. Our campus community across the system and many of our community partners off campus have called for greater accountability in a variety of areas, including law enforcement practices um, that has um, had renewed voice in the um, advent of the events in Kenosha, Wisconsin a few days ago. So here in the Twin Cities, the University of Minnesota Police Department, which continues to serve our Twin Cities campus admirably, and has built a reputation for responsible public safety still reflects that there's opportunity for continuous improvement, that it's from a position of strength that we are aware that we can always self-review and ask ourselves hard questions about how we might get better or how we might evolve in order to be the equitable campus community that we are committed to being. So to work effectively towards meaningful evolution, on August 26th, we announced that we retained Dr. Cedric Alexander, a noted academic and civic leader with a deep knowledge of law enforcement and community engagement. And we've asked him to come in and complete a comprehensive review of where or how we can evolve and how to best engage our community in that process. We're very grateful and excited about Dr. Alexander's partnership and expertise and insights. In the coming days and weeks, he'll meet with students, student association, university staff, faculty, community organizations, UMPD, our community law enforcement partners. We've also made him available across the system um, to ask, answer questions for other campuses. While this is primarily a Twin Cities review as a starting point, he of course works um, for all of us and has agreed to be helpful in that regard so that we can build a safe campus environment in every meaning of the word safety and we'll be reporting on the progress of his review as it evolves. We also, um, as we mentioned in previous reports, have a shared commitment to our tribal community partners. On August 27th, I met with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council to address concerns that they've shared with us via resolution, both to me and to the board. We agreed to take some important next steps together, including among other agreements, a commitment to meet at least three times a year and those meetings are being scheduled now. And as we move forward, we'll continue this historic dialogue, which I'm informed is the first of its kind to deepen our relationship with and engagement with the 11 sovereign tribal nations in Minnesota. Members of the board, with respect for our community, we uh, postponed the renamings policy discussion that we referred to 
earlier this morning in the governance committee that was originally planned to be before you in June so that the community could process those events and think about how that might affect our commitment to equity across the board and in particular with regard to renamings. Recent months have at a minimum inspired reflection including the actions of higher education institutions across the country that have evaluated how they honor various community members through the naming of buildings and monuments or how they've honored historical figures with controversial and complex pasts and legacies. We are continuing to consult the draft renamings policy as a result of this reflection and we will bring it forward to you for discussion in our October meeting. Also at the October meeting, we plan to present for review metrics aligned to the action items from the MPAC 2025 system-wide strategic plan. This next phase of our work together builds off the conversation during the July board retreat, where we initiated a process to review and refresh the University of Minnesota progress card, which we also refer to as our maroon and gold measures. They are one and the same. Since that time, university senior leaders have been consulting with their stakeholders around these potential measures we're pulling that feedback together for that October presentation and we'll have more for you then. I also wanna update you on our student mental health initiative. We're still planning yes this fall to have our statewide mental health summit in conjunction with our partners at Minnesota State as well as our Minnesota private university and college counterparts. We had originally planned the summit for May, 2020 but have postponed it. So we'll do it this fall virtually and it will feature keynote speaker, Sarah Abelson, a national leader in the field of student mental health, as well as a series of breakout sessions designed to reflect the different points of view that all of us come to this issue with and for. We look more forward to sharing more details about the summit in the days ahead. Members of the board, um, pending your approval today, Myron Franz will join the University of Minnesota on September 30th as our next senior vice president of finance and operations. <laughs> Myron is a recognized leader in strategic financial management and most recently served under Governor Tim Walls as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Management and Budget Office, or MMB. Myron brings incredible experience, knowledge, and strategic stewardship to our operations system-wide, and we really look forward to him joining the senior team and consulting widely with all of you and the community at large as he comes on board. I also want to sincerely thank Brian Burnett, the outgoing SVP for his service, his passion and his commitment to the university. We're very grateful that he will be serving as an advisor to me through March 2nd, 2021. And my thanks to Julie Tonson, who is agreeing to serve <clears throat> the interim SVP until Myron <clears throat> on September 30th. Other updates on the senior team. In January, we launched a national search for a vice president for student affairs and dean of students. But in March, as a result of the pandemic, we paused the search. The search committee resumed its work last month with an aim to recommend finalists for public interviews this fall. My thanks to co-chairs of the search committee, Vice President Michael Goh and Dean Jean Kwam and the entire community for their willingness to serve on this very important search as the university restarts this process. But I also want to thank Vice President, Interim Vice President Maggie Towell as she continues to serve in this role. She's also on the search committee and has committed, not surprising to any of us who know her, to making sure that as the new vice president arrives that they have her full support in standing up in this new and expanded role. A couple of other updates for you members of the board. Last week, the University Relations Office launched a new look for the U of M website. It's first redesigned since 2015. The new site takes five years of user data where users click, how they engage, how they reach the site, et cetera, and build an entire new user interface targeting our number one user, who is the prospective student. Our research found that over one half of all users who reach the home site do so as prospective students. So the interface and the news stories will be aimed at them. We hope you like it and we look forward to your feedback on the new website. And members of the board, as has become practice, at the end of these reports, I've had the pleasure of updating you and our university family on how we've leveraged our talents and resourcefulness to uplift our university community, serve our state and impact the world. Things we've captured through the hashtag UMN proud. To this end, I have a few bits of good news for you. I'm proud to note that Governor Walls recently sent a certificate of recognition to the U of M's Catherine E. Nash Gallery 
in support of its forthcoming exhibition, A Picture Gallery of the Soul. The exhibition will be presented next year, September 14th through December 11th, 2021, and incorporates the photographic medium of African-American artists from the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. So this will be something for us to look forward to next fall. I have a shout out to our Vice President of Research, Chris Kramer, who received a 2021 Chemical Soci American Chemical Society Arthur C. Cope Late Career Scholars Award for his excellence in organic chemistry. Congrats to Chris for this well-deserved honor and to our entire research enterprise that despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic has seen research awards that are up over 12.9 million since last year. And lastly, although COVID canceled, oh, actually this isn't lastly, although COVID canceled this year's Minnesota State Fair, I'm very pleased to report the tradition of Princess K and the Milky Way carried on. Brenna Connolly, a 19-year-old University of Minnesota student from Byron, Minnesota, and representing Olmsted County, was crowned the 67th Princess K of the Milky Way last month. Brenna's first official duty was to have her likeness sculpted in a 90-pound block of butter in a walk-in glass-walled refrigerator at the dairy building of the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. So congratulations to Brenna. And then last, but certainly not least, I'm pleased to report that it was ju we just learned in the last couple of days that for the first time in its 150 year history, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, or better known as the Met, has hired its first full-time Native American curator, our alumna, Dr. Patricia Norby. So congratulations to Dr. Norby, congratulations to the Met. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, thank you, President uh, Gable, for that uh, very good report. There are many, many, many good things happening at the university. I also just want to say, I think uh, probably most, if not all of us, do and do indeed remember where we were uh, on September 11th, and I thank you for that remembrance, uh, which I think is probably very much appreciated by the board and everyone who's who's lo who's looking on. Um, I'll be very brief. I just want to say uh, we're very happy to hear that uh, we're, things are starting up at Crookston, uh, UMD, and, and Morris uh, in good form so far, and we look forward to having students back on the Twin Cities and Rochester campuses in the coming weeks. And I just want to underline and underscore a point that uh, the president just made that and to remind the entire university community that uh, this board and our leadership is doing uh, everything we can to balance the health and safety uh, uh, measures with the needs of our students, but we will always, uh, as you heard from the president, put safety first. And I do want to thank uh, you, President Gable and Provost Croson, and and your teams for your flexibility and adaptability, uh, and 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 your leadership during these pivots. I guess they're now called graceful pivots, and maybe more to come. But um, uh, thank you for working so hard to uh, keep us successful uh, and safe as we move into the fall semester. Much of our work is changing uh, as a, our board work is changing in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We continue to view uh, our future in a post-pandemic light. Uh, yesterday, as we reviewed the university's biennial budget request of the state, we acknowledged the fact that the state, like the university, will face significant financial challenges in coming years. And as I said before, the pandemic continues to drive many of the critical decisions and the discussions that we're having and our decisions as a board, we know have very meaningful, very real impact on daily lives of this entire university community. So I really just uh, will conclude my report by thanking everyone, thanking the board, thanking all of you who are viewing today and are working so hard. Thank you for your continued patience as the university responds often very rapidly uh, to the public health crisis in order to protect uh, our students, our faculty, and our staff. Um, and I would also, I'll just conclude uh, by saying, I know we'll have uh, further opportunities down the road, but uh, on behalf of the board, um, I would like to uh, also uh, thank um, Brian Burnett for his uh, outstanding service to the university, and we'll have more uh, uh, thanks and recognition of him uh, later, uh, I'm sure. So with that, uh, we'll now return to, we'll now turn to item four, uh, which is the receive and file reports. Uh, please note uh, those items uh, reported uh, in the docket uh, materials. 
and I think that covers uh, grant and contract activities, uh, among other things. We'll next consider the consent report, uh, and this uh, covers primarily gifts to the university. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent report? So moved. So, moved. so moved, and is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Moved and it's been moved and seconded. Uh, I'll pause for a moment to see if there are any uh, region questions or comments uh, on uh, the consent report. I don't see any hands raised on my screen. Uh, Mr. Steves, do, uh, do you see anyone who might want to comment? Mr. Chair, I do not. Okay. All right, then um, with no questions or comments, uh, we'll call uh, the roll on a uh, motion to approve the consent report. On the consent report, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. <laughs> Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. <laughs> Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and none opposed. Thank you, Mr. Steve. So the consent report uh, is approved. Uh, we'll move now to item six. Uh, and we will now have a, a discussion of strategies for enhancing diversity and inclusion for our staff. Uh, as the, I think the board will recall, this is the third of a three-part series on this topic of uh, diversity and inclusion. We've previously discussed uh, our work here as it relates to students uh, and faculty. Uh, and today, joining us for the conversation uh, on, on the staff uh, component of this important topic are Michael Goh, Vice President uh, for the Office uh, for Equity and Diversity, Berejita Singh, uh, the Associate Vice Provost for the Office for Equity and Diversity, and Brandon Sullivan, the Senior Director for Leadership, Talent, and Development uh, in the Office of Human Resources. I believe that... Um, President Gable uh, would like to kick off this conversation. So uh, President Gable, we'll turn it over to you for uh, an introduction. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spigum, members of the board. The university is anchored into advancing community and belonging, one of the five core commitments of the newly approved MPAC 2025 system strategic plan. And more specifically, we are committed to enhancing staff diversity and inclusion and building a welcoming community where everyone has a strong sense of belonging and where equity and diversity are promoted, including through increased representation and where dignity and people and ideas are respected. These are words, ideas and actions that we have to act upon and demonstrate our commitment to so that we can ensure that all staff, students and faculty see themselves in these actions and in the overall community of our institution. So today's presentation builds from a conversation in February around faculty diversity and inclusion, and in June around student diversity and inclusion to bring us to the topic we have before us today. And as I said in my inaugural address as president a year ago in just a few days, we will take leaps when needed, but incremental steps as necessary, but that we will work together to ensure that each step, however large or small moves us forward. And I think you'll see that represented in the presentation today. But before I turn it over to the team who will make the presentation, I want to express my thanks to Michael Goh and his entire team for all they do to advance greater equity and diversity across the university in the community and beyond. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll turn it over to the team. Thank you, President Gable. Uh, Vice President Goh, I think we'll turn to you to lead us off and to kind of orchestrate your, the, your other uh, panelists who are with you. Thank you. Um... Is the first slide uh, being displayed yet? 
Yes, it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ch Chair Powell, Vice Chair Swigum, President Gable, members of the board. I'm very pleased to be here with uh, my colleagues, uh, Associate Vice Provost Rajita Singh, Senior Director of Leadership and Talent Development in the Office of Human Resources, Brandon Sullivan, to speak with you about the important topic <laughs> of staff diversity and inclusion. I also wish to recognize Interim Vice President for Human Resources, Ken Horstman, and Associate Vice President for Equity and Diversity, Julie Showers, who are also prepared to answer your questions at the end of this presentation. I'm grateful, uh, President Gable, for your remarks, um, setting the tone for this presentation, as well as your report earlier that reminds us of the context of our commitment and work as a university community system-wide to address racial and social justice in our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Chair Powell, you're right. This presentation is the third in a three-part series, which we began in February, where we discussed strategies for enhancing diversity and inclusion among faculty, including efforts at the college level to support the university's diversity and inclusion goals. In June, we then discussed the efforts to increase representational diversity amongst our student populations and emphasized the importance of addressing campus climate through targeted programming and initiatives. You might also recall last October, we provided information about campus climate for undergraduate students utilizing data from the SARU survey. And these presentations have allowed us to deeply explore how we approach the complex and challenging work of diversity, equity, and inclusion at our university system. Today, we will talk about an important population that has not yet been discussed in this series. The university's professional and support staff are one of its most valuable assets, holding much of the systemic knowledge, intellectual capital required to ensure the functioning of our university and the achievement of our most ambitious goals. We have a diversity of staff positions, including labor representatives, civil service, professional administrative staff, who have a variety of roles and responsibilities. These positions range from researchers, scientists, lab managers, human resource professionals, student facing advisors and support roles, legal staff. In your docket materials, we, you will see an expanded, though not exhaustive, list of the many critical staff roles on all our campuses across the university system. In this slide, research has demonstrated that representation of a wide variety of experiences and perspectives drives innovation, higher creativity, faster problem solving, better decision making. We have previously shared similar research that supports um, faculty and student diversity efforts as well. Organizations with higher levels of representational diversity secure higher levels of employee engagement, leading to employees feeling more valued and less likely to leave their positions, resulting in reduced turnover. Additionally, attracting and retaining a diverse workforce enhances our ability to secure <clears throat> top talent from diverse talent pools and positions the university as a more desirable place to work, whether in Crookston, Duluth, Morris, Rochester, or in the Twin Cities. Next slide, please. Thank you. President Gable has prioritized diversity, equity, inclusion through the MPAC 2025 system-wide strategic plan that has been mentioned today as well, and specifically with commitment for community and belonging. Community 4 focuses on the importance of fostering a welcoming community that values belonging, equity, diversity, and dignity in people and ideas. The three major goals under this commitment are recruiting, retaining diverse talent, cultivating an inclusive and welcoming campus climate, and advancing an understanding and nurture, sorry, advancing understanding and nurturing enduring partnerships. As President Gable has mentioned, we want to go beyond just words and grand visions. We want to see the action and as a result, the associated action items and metrics that we are in discussion right now will allow us to continually track, evaluate and adjust our approaches in order to support the university students, staff and faculty diversity and inclusion goals. Next slide, please. Our current work in the area of staff diversity and inclusion has been carried out through partnerships between our office and colleges, campuses, 
and other administrative offices. In this moment, uh, post George Floyd and the continuing emerging racial injustices and uprisings, we are grateful for the many voices uh, from faculty, staff, and students that have emerged uh, that call attention to different ideas and different ways. And we continue to listen, even as we focus on building and supporting with our ongoing strategic vision that is a three part. First, increasing representational diversity, assessing and improving campus climate, and building institutional capacity around diversity, equity, and inclusion among college and campus leadership across our entire system. Our presentation today is structured to provide you with more information about these key priorities, leading to a discussion at the end where we can hear your input and feedback as we implement the system-wide strategic plan. Next slide, please. Regarding the representational diversity, OED and the Office for Human Resource works together to support units to recruit, retain, and develop underrepresented staff in partnership with colleges and campuses. An important part of this work is providing implicit bias training to hiring managers and search committees with the goal of disrupting bias that can inhibit our efforts to increase representational diversity. The Implicit Bias Workshop, for example, provides an overview of research on implicit bias, guides participants through video-based scenarios to support their ability to identify bias, provides information on inclusive hiring best practices, and encourages committees to openly discuss how they will disrupt bias during the search and selection process. Beyond implicit bias training, the Office for Human Resources also supports university policy that aids recruiting a diverse qualified applicant pool and provides onboarding for new employees. And yesterday you also heard about HR analytics tools that we envision will help us towards these goals. Now for a deeper dive into the Office for Human Resources efforts, I'll turn it over to Senior Director Brendan Sullivan, who will discuss assessing and improving campus climate for staff. Brendan. Thank you. Uh, Chair Powell, members of the board. Um, next slide, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, the goal of a healthy campus climate is an environment where everyone, faculty, uh, staff, students, uh, feel valued and a sense of belonging. This allows everyone to do their best work, to feel supported, and it contributes to both productivity as well as well-being. Uh, there's no single way to assess campus climate, and there are lots of different pieces and parts to it. Um, but one of our important tools in this is our system-wide employee engagement survey. Uh, which is administered to staff and faculty biannually. Uh, our most recent survey was conducted in April of, or I'm sorry, in October of uh, 2019. Um, and just to give you a, a little background on that, the survey itself was developed based on a combination of external scientific research and industry best practice in these types of employee surveys, as well as a considerable amount of internal research on what engagement looks like here at the University of Minnesota. And we had a faculty advisory group that guided the creation of our survey to ensure that it would be relevant for um, our, uh, our university uh, system. The survey has 36 items that measure commitment and dedication, as well as key aspects of the work environment. For purposes of looking at campus climate, we focus on four items that are kind of the most direct uh, indicators of climate. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the first climate indicator that we look at is, is the response to the survey item. Overall, my department demonstrates a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion. And just to quickly orient you to the charts, uh, the green bar represents the percent who responded favorably to that item. The gray bar represents the percent who responded neutrally. Um, and then the red bar represents the percent who responded unfavorably to the item. So it's a way of really kind of looking at a whole lot of different survey responses in terms of, um, kind of uh, favorability. Uh, I would note this is system-wide data. So this, this data is from staff and faculty across <laughs> the system. Um, and this is data in the charts from the 2019 survey. Um, we had an overall response rate of 74% uh, to the survey, which was very strong. Um, and uh, what you'll see uh, in the column under six year change in percent favorable, that shows you how the favorability has changed between the first survey that we conducted in 2013 and the most recent survey in 2019. So that'll give you a sense for how some of those 
perceptions have changed. And just a couple of rules of thumb uh, on this with, with data like this at a, at a large organization, with, given the numbers here, generally about a 70 or more favorability is considered a pretty strong result. Um, if you have 20 or more in that neutral, that gray area, um, that tends to indicate opportunity. People are, are saying, you know, they've maybe had mixed experiences, they haven't made up their minds yet, they're kind of waiting to see. It generally indicates opportunity um, for the organization to, to do something to, to, to sort of create more of a positive experience there. 20 or more unfavorable uh, generally indicates an area that might need some attention because you have one in five survey respondents saying that that isn't favorable. Um, so this uh, particular item uh, was an area of focus coming out of the 2014 engagement survey. Um, and th that survey showed that many staff and faculty, especially staff and faculty of color, did not consistently see a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion from their departments. So this has been a key area of focus uh, for action over the past several years since that survey. Uh, the survey data here that you see suggests a general trend over the past several years where many staff and faculty have seen an increased commitment to diversity and inclusion within their departments. And this is true across racial and ethnic groups uh, to the extent that we can break that down. Um, at the same time, uh, there's obviously a lot more work to do in this area. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the second climate indicator is the response to the survey item, I am treated with respect as an individual. In general, this item has high favorability for most groups and responses to this item have been consistently higher um, on all of the surveys that we've done compared to the previous item about demonstrated commitment to diversity and inclusion. And this suggests that many people feel respected day to day by their colleagues, um, while also seeing a need for continued work to demonstrate a clear and sustained commitment to diversity and inclusion. Next slide, please. Thank you. The third climate indicator is the response to the survey item, I have opportunities to achieve my personal career objectives at my campus. And this item reflects the degree of support for career development and advancement as an important part of providing an inclusive workplace and retaining a diverse workforce. Overall, responses to this item have shifted in a more favorable direction over the past several years, including among uh, staff of color, as well as American Indian and Black faculty. And this item has also been the focus for a lot of action over the past several years. Next slide, please. The fourth climate indicator, the final one, is the response to the survey item, given your choice, how long would you plan to continue working for the University of Minnesota? And on this item, the response, uh, responses are a little bit different. Um, a green uh, or the favorable response indicates more than five years or until retirement. The gray represents the percent who responded three to five years, and the red represents the percent who responded zero to two years. Now, intent to stay with an organization, which is what this item uh, is intended to measure, is a commonly used key metric in many organizations for looking at turnover intentions. And it, it tends to answer, uh, and answers to this question uh, are often highly predictive of future turnover. So if you look at the six year trends on this item, it's a little mixed. Um, and you, know, you can see some have gone up, some have gone down. Um, and that suggests there are some important opportunities uh, when it comes to uh, retaining a diverse workforce. I would also uh, say that uh, one of the challenges that we've had historically is really connecting data points. And I think we now have the opportunity to start looking specifically at some of the key drivers of retention and turnover using some of the tools and the data discussed by my colleague, Interim Vice President Horstman in the HR analytics presentation yesterday. As we expand that work and connect it uh, up with this sort of survey data, this will help us to identify additional actions we can take uh, to improve climate. Next slide, please. So overall, uh, the six years of engagement data that we have suggests some broad-based perceptions of improvement in the climate across racial and ethnic groups, uh, some improvements in perceptions that departments are committed to diversity and inclusion, um, and some notable increases in perceptions of career opportunities. 
Um, uh, there is uh, more work to do, however, in really looking at uh, drivers of retention. Um, and of course, the survey was conducted in October of last year. And uh, with all of the events that have happened uh, this year, uh, post George Floyd and, and, and other things that have been happening, there's obviously increased urgency and need to look at some of this, uh, this going forward in a new way. Um, finally, uh, it's important to note uh, that this data is system-wide data. Um, so we're looking overall at the, all of the faculty and staff who uh, completed the survey, um, but individual employee experiences are most influenced by experiences in the local work environment. Um, you may have heard the saying that people leave bad bosses, not bad jobs. Uh, reality is a little more com complicated than that, but there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and so our supervisors, managers, and leaders play a very critical role in creating an inclusive climate at the local level. Uh, and so as a result, the best approach to improving climate is to focus both on the system-wide efforts and looking at this kind of data, but also supporting, uh, encouraging uh, local efforts. Uh, next slide, please. Because leaders and supervisors play such an important role in shaping the climate, uh, the Office of Equity and Diversity and the Office of Human Resources worked together a few years ago to create leadership competencies, specific skills, knowledge, and abilities that are needed to create an inclusive climate. Uh, these are part of the university leadership competencies uh, and are used in various leadership assessment and development practices, such as 360 degree feedback surveys, leadership development programs, and some units use these for performance evaluations. Uh, they can also be used by supervisors and managers as part of ongoing feedback and development coaching conversations throughout the year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we believe that everyone who works at the university is a leader. Uh, for example, some lead through managing others, some lead through their teaching and scholarship, some lead through helping groups solve complex problems, and so on. And the leadership competencies describe the challenges facing all of these kinds of leaders, along with the skills needed to meet those challenges. Uh, so here's an example on this slide of what this looks like for managers and supervisors, along with the competencies specific to equity and diversity. And this can become a common set of expectations to help everyone do their part in creating an inclusive culture, uh, especially at the local level. At this point, uh, Chair Paul, uh, We'll turn over the presentation to Associate Vice Provost Rajita Singh to talk about program staff diversity. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Powell and members of the board, I'm pleased to present with Vice President Go and Senior Director of Leadership and Talent Development in the Office of Human Resources, Brandon Sullivan, to highlight the programs that support staff diversity and build institutional capacity around diversity, equity, and inclusion, also referred to as DEI among college and campus leadership. Let me start by talking about affinity groups at our university. Affinity groups help make the University of Minnesota a more welcoming and inclusive place to work and learn. Strong staff-led networks enhance the ability to attract and retain the best talent, promote leadership and development at all ranks, and build an internal support system for staff at all levels. Next slide, please. There are currently many active staff and faculty affinity groups at the university, including the 10 listed on this slide. Many are open to all within the university community. Some, for example, the CLA indigenous staff and staff of color community operate at the college level, or in the case of the Women's Leadership Institute, allow faculty and staff to apply for participation in a biannual cohort. In a predominantly white institution, these affinity groups across diverse underrepresented identities create tangible opportunities to connect and achieve a sense of belonging. Next slide, please. In order to increase representational diversity and improve campus climate, it is imperative that college and campus leadership build capacity to engage effectively and sensitively across differences. OED advances DEI through education, training, consultation, and convening staff, faculty, and leaders across the system. OHR offers employee engagement support for colleges, campuses, units through online tools, resources, and training consulting for input sessions, discussion, and action planning, as well as supervisory development webinars and modules. 
There are a number of efforts underway to support colleges and units working to increase their capacity to advance DEI across the university. Next slide, please. For example, the Diversity Community of Practice, also referred to as the DCOP, is a grassroots community of faculty and staff from collegiate and administrative units that began on the Twin Cities campus and now has expanded to include representatives from all five campuses. The DCOP, which meets monthly, brings together university community members across fields and disciplines to develop and leverage personal, professional, and technical expertise to effectively create innovative strategies that advance equity and diversity goals at the University of Minnesota. Just uh, an example recently was uh, our monthly meeting had about 91 members participating, um, especially post George Floyd's murder. There's been a lot of activity in this com community. The DCOP has five committees, the DCOP Programming Committee, DCOP Assessment Committee, DCOP Communications Committee, and a newer DCOP Organizing Committee. The fifth committee, the DCOP Policy Review Committee, was formed on the invitation of the Policy Advisory Committee, also known as PAC. Each time a new policy is established or an existing policy is reviewed, the policy is sent to this DCOP committee for review with an equity lens. Applying an equity lens refers to a process for analyzing or diagnosing the impact of the design and implementation of policies on the underserved or marginalized individuals and groups and identifying and eliminating barriers where possible. Next slide, please. From its inception, the DCOP has grown from 25 to 300 plus participants representing over 105 units and academic departments. 90% of DCOP members are staff members, the remaining 10% are faculty. Every month we receive a few more new applications from the university staff and faculty interested to join the DCOP. As someone who coordinates and facilitates the work of the DCOP on behalf of OED and our university, I'm energized by the passion and commitment of DCOP members who bring their many intersectional identities to advance equity and inclusion at the University of Minnesota together in partnership with each other. Next slide, please. OED's Equity and Diversity Certificate is one of OED's important and popular offerings. It is offered without charge to all university faculty, staff, and students. The Equity and Diversity Certificate helps participants develop tools necessary for advancing equity and diversity in all aspects of their personal and professional lives. The program consists of 10 three-hour workshops that, one, offer participants work, two, help participants develop necessary skills for equity and diversity work, and three, give participants direct experience working and communicating across differences. Beginning in March 2020, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the program pivoted to an online learning platform referred to as ECHO, which stands for Equity Certificate Hosted Online. As you'll note in the docket materials, the variety of topics covered in the 10 workshops range from my role in equity and diversity work to addressing implicit bias and microaggressions to religious and spiritual identities and to understanding and advancing gender equity. Next slide, please. Moving forward, we expect to focus on three areas. First, MPAC 2025 will be used to evaluate DEI efforts system-wide. Second, related to talent management, we expect to advance ongoing adverse impact analysis for each step in the employee life cycle and interventions where needed. We also expect to address succession management and leadership development. And finally, related to staff diversity, equity and inclusion capacity building, OED and OHR will collaborate to expand DEI training for all employees. Thank you for the opportunity to present on staff diversity. With that, Chair Powell, I turn it back to you and the board for any questions and discussions. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, presenters, for um, a very um, thorough and, and comprehensive uh, presentation. And, and I think we, uh, we appreciate the progress uh, that you've made and some of the 
uh, survey data is 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 moving uh, in a very good direction, and some of and the organizations around com community of practice and affinity groups, I I, I find it to be um, to be encouraging. Um, while um, while we, we wait for colleagues uh, to my colleagues to um, formulate questions, and I see hands <laughs> hands are starting to raise now. Um, I'd like to ask a, a, a question, uh, for, uh, Vice President Go. maybe this is to you. I mean, do we have some of the numeric data on uh, representation uh, among staff that could be shared with the, with the board today? Because I think that is also, the survey data is certainly very important. Uh, the status of affinity groups important, but I think just the, the sort of the core metrics are also important. And I'm wondering if, if that is something that could be made available to, uh, to the board today. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. I believe you will find on page 50 of your docket materials onwards the, the demographic data that we were able to get thanks to the Office for Institutional Research. So there's uh, quite a bit of data to digest there. That Is that something that could be um, put up on the screen or... Looks like there is uh, some good um, headcount data on, on page 51. Yes. Well, while, you know, I guess I'll, I'll ask my question and then we, 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 can, we can go to the others. But as, you know, as we look at the, you know, the administ as the, the number is employees by ethnicity, um, I guess I was, um, surprised by the relatively low percentages um, of um, Native, uh, African American, Hispanic, you know, in the sort of two to three percent or, or lower. And, and I, I'm, 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 my recollections may be wrong, but I would guess that that would compare, that would be relatively lower than many um, private sector employers, for example, in the Twin Cities. And maybe I would, so I would just appreciate your perspective on the metrics uh, and, and percentages. They, they seem, they seem um, low to me, um, but I obviously would like your perspective on it. Thank you, Chair Powell. <laughs> and I uh, invite uh, Interim Vice uh, President Ken Horsman, if you, would like to chime in, but uh, yes, I agree they are low. And, and sadly, they, they do mirror um, the demographics in our faculty, as well as our student representation, save the uh, Duluth and Morris campus with, with higher representations of American uh, Indian students. Um, but, but they do reflect, um, even if it's a trend up, um, sometimes what you'll find is a greater representation of uh, African, African American in some of our labor represented uh, facilities management um, areas, um, but, but they, they, they are work that we continue to have before us with our American Indian, Black, um, and Latinx communities. Okay, well, th thank you for that perspective. Um, and uh, I'll, I wanna move on to the, uh, my colleagues now, but I guess I, I would, I would suggest that you know, maybe we could do a little bit of benchmarking for, of those percentages to other employee employment sectors you know in our community or sort of national benchmarks um, so that we can you know have clarity on on, on, on how we're doing and uh, and because I think that that needs focus and I'll, I'll leave it at that now and, and go to my colleagues uh, and uh, I see uh, uh, Regent Simonson has his hand up. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, presenters. I, I really appreciate it. My comments or questions probably <clears throat> be directed more at Senior Director Sullivan. Uh, I appreciated the inclusion survey that you did. Uh, and I think you said it was across the university, but you do have breakouts by college or department. And looking again, these low percentages of uh, of uh, diversity ethnicity on that chart that we just looked at is, is concerning, I think, but <clears throat> um, having looked at it, uh, are, are there particular areas like science versus arts departments that uh, are really 
uh, affecting those numbers. Uh, my alma mater is the College of Veterinary Medicine. And, and the diversity there uh, from the time I was a graduate student to uh, when I was adjunct faculty, on and on and on, I've always appreciated the diversity there. It's very diverse and, and uh, it still is today. And, and I've always appreciated that. So I'm wondering if these percentages are impacted. <coughs> and what are we doing to look at that issue? Thank you. And is that a question, uh, Regent Simon, to, to Director Sullivan or, or who? Yeah, I think, well, anybody could answer, but- Okay, I all right. Uh, Vice President Go, we'll let you do direct traffic here. Go ahead, uh, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Powell, uh, Regent Simonson. Um, yeah, so to, to address your, your question, we do, so the, the data is system level data, right? And the story, um, often varies at the local level. And we do as part of a process we call the college made process that's led by the Office of Equity. <coughs> that includes like this. We do break down the data by college and meet with, and this is, um, this is for the academic colleges, not the administrative units at this point in time, but we do meet with them and we share the data for their college, uh, not just the engagement data, a lot of other data, um, as part of looking at what's happening at the local level, what are some actions that can be taken at the college level or even the department level? Um, as, uh, you are correct in that, you know, that some, some co different colleges vary in terms of their, um, what the, their faculty and staff are saying. Um, what I would say though, is that it ties in with the first, uh, the first comment or question that was made about representational diversity. The numbers often are very small. So once you start breaking the survey data down by college for many, many, many of our colleges, um, the, uh, the number of survey respondents in the various racial and ethnic demographic groups are so small that you either can't really report that or it, it question is what does that mean if you only have a few people in terms of interpreting the data. So that is, uh, it's connected with the first challenge in a, in a really important way. Thank you. Regent Simonson, uh, does, that, does that get at it or follow up? Yeah, uh, no, I, I think that gets at it, but it, it seems to me part of this too, like I said in the College of Veterinary Medicine, a lot of the faculty were graduate students there. They did their doctorates there and then went on uh, to uh, to their DBM or whatever, went on to uh, be faculty. And I think uh, um, recruitment of people of, of, of color and immigrants and stuff is really important. And I think the university reaching out that way will help in a lot of ways. So just my comment. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Simonson. Uh, Regent Shoup. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, I just have some questions. I think you, uh, Mr. Chair, you touched on um, the um, issue involving kind of the data. And um, I guess my issue um, regarding data is the fact that every time we get this presentation, we get the new data, but we never really see um, how we're doing over time. Uh, and I know there there is some data here related to that, but um, it's not clear to me exactly where we're going, what the gap is, um, what are our overall all goals for um, uh, for this area, and um, you know the, it's important as uh, Regent Simonson said to look at the college level, and um, right now I don't see any data about kind of what's going on in, in all of our colleges. Where is the, we all know that uh, we have pockets of diversity and we have pockets of non-diversity um, all over the place. And uh, without being able to see it at that level, it's hard to see um, kind of one, what kind of impact we're having. And then lastly, um, uh, Regan Simonson did mention um, what I consider to be the pipeline problem. And that problem uh, is significant as we are competing against uh, all other businesses and all sectors and other higher education institutions for, uh, for people. And I'm not sure um, uh, exactly what we're doing in that area and how, um, how effective we're, we're actually being and, and how much money we're spending uh, to try and solve this problem. So uh, if you could just react to that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, Vice President Go, maybe that one goes to you. Thank you, Regent Xu. Yeah, I'll start off and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Interim Vice President if you can address the second part of Regent Xu's question. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell. Thank you, uh, Regent Xu, for your question. Um, this is the first time I've ever presented uh, data on staff. So, so there is, uh, I'm not sure what the, every time we present data on staff comment is about, but, but I do uh, take uh, the, the comment uh, to heart because I think it's a good point to, and now that we've presented this, I appreciate the ability to, to maybe compare the data over a stretch of time. Uh, many of us are in this uh, leadership position for the first time presenting on this data. So um, I will take that uh, comment. And, advice, um, Regent Xu. Um, Interim Vice President um, Ken, I wonder if you have a comment around how uh, we as a university maybe are reaching into the communities of potential candidates. Uh, thank you, Vice President Go, um, and I'm, I'm happy to comment. Um, I actually, I would agree with uh, Chair Powell's and Regent Xu's um, assessment, we do have data that goes back uh, at least a decade and would reflect that uh, our population, uh, our diverse population is skewed toward the labor represented and civil service uh, positions and less so in faculty and professional staff. Um, we are approaching recruiting differently in this moment. We are looking at diverse impact analysis to assess and set objectives and goals uh, going forward uh, to inform uh, how our applicant pools reflect the demographics in our area. And I do think there's additional benchmarking needed to our local employer environment as well as nationally. What I would say is when candidates do approach the university, uh, how we, uh, and I apologize for my dogs, um, but how we uh, address this internally is very important because they are interviewing us and how we develop our people, how we provide a career path for them, how we engage them in a broader perspective, how open we are uh, in our discussions to uh, welcome uh, points of conflict in our discussions. Uh, all um, are known in the community uh, when someone is being interviewed for a professional or faculty position. So along with recruiting, uh, some of the programs you're hearing about in performance management, in analytics, uh, in supervisory development, and uh, in career development are very important to addressing this issue. Uh, we do not only just want to attract uh, these uh, individuals, we want to retain them and grow them in their career. And uh, so that work is, uh, as Vice President Gosses <coughs> are coming into this in, in, a, in the recent years, but I think uh, the table is set to, uh, uh, to understand this challenge better and to address it. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Horseman. Uh, let's move on now to Regent Anderson. Okay, I am here. I just had to unmute. Um, my question is going to go to Mr. Sullivan. On his surveys, I, I noticed that it, it appears that the indices, we are making progress from 2013 to 2019, and I, I appreciate that. Um, the, one, the one place I'd ask him to, to comment is on virtually each one of the surveys, the demographic uh, of Hispanic seems to be trailing. Do you have any comment? And uh, I will put myself back on mute and just listen and I can go from there. Thank you. All right, uh, that one goes to Senior Director Sullivan, I believe. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Powell, uh, Regent Anderson. Um, yes, I, that there is uh, you know, some, some trend in that direction on the survey um, data. And uh, you know, to, to be honest, I, when I see that at the system level, I am not 100% sure what some of the causes of that would be. Um, you know, there, and, and it possibly uh, <laughs> Vice President uh, Go would have some, some thoughts on that as well. When I look at the data, I would agree with, with your observation. Um, and I think it's something that warrants some discussion and some probably exploration on, you know, what 
what that reflects um, and what might be some of the causes. To, to be honest, I haven't seen anything in any of the survey data that would tell me clearly um, or, or anyone else that I'm aware of who's really looked at that survey data, sort of what, what is driving that. Um, but I, I agree with your, your comment and, and that's probably, that's worth uh, us digging into a little bit more. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Regent uh, Anderson, and thanks for the response. Uh, Regent Herr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, I have a question with regards to, oh, and then I want to thank uh, Vice President uh, Michael Go um, for the presentation. It was very well put together. Um, a lot of thought went into it. And I, I do appreciate it. Uh, my question, and I think your comment gets to the heart of the matter um, and why we're here today, is that, you know, this is really the first time that we're looking at statistics and stats about uh, staff and faculty. And so I'm really looking at this as a base uh, uh, point for growth. And so I'm really, um, I didn't hear a lot. Um, and so um, my recommendation going forward, and I'm sure you, you, you have it in, in the works, is really looking at the area of hiring. How are we gonna increase these numbers? Um, and then, and then uh, looking at data to say, uh, in terms of retention, and are we really growing? Are, are people being promoted? Are people being um, uh, um, at, at, at at, at, at all levels um, that we are where we should be or where we want to be and that we have goals and aspirations. So I, I do like it that over time, uh, in terms of climate, people are feeling um, better about the university and we're doing things that are right um, with regards to say the affinity groups um, um, and other things to make sure that uh, when people come, they stay, they feel, they feel that they belong, they feel that they're welcomed. But, um, the hard part um, and, and the presentation didn't address much is how are we going to get people in? Um, how are we going to increase the numbers of, of, um, of underrepresented um, staff and faculty members? And those are my, my comments, Mr. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Regent, for, for, the, for that comment, which I think echoes uh, you know, uh, many of the points that have been made by other, other regions. There's, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of consistency mm -hmm. here. Um, uh, Mr. Steves, I don't see any other raised hands. Do you have, uh, do you, from where you are sitting, do you see anyone else who would like to be recognized? I do see now Regent Kenyana. Mm -hmm. Is that, okay, uh, so Regent Kenyana, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, VP Go and other presenters. Uh, we appreciate your time and effort into this. Uh, my comments brief and similar to one I made when we spoke about this in terms of faculty, I think, um, all these challenges are codependent, um, and this one, this one is uh, exacerbated by um, our achievement gap in, in amongst our students. Um, so, you know, I think we have to focus on all of them. If 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 there's an achievement gap with students of color, then you won't have the qualified candidates that you're looking for. Um, so, I always want to keep that. Uh, you know, front of mind. And I also appreciate that this data is broken out because um, if you look at the aggregate and say, okay, well, we have this percent of Hispanic employees and this percent of, you know, black employees, but then there, none of them are in administrative roles, they're all civil service or PNA. Um, that's an issue as well. So I appreciate that it's broken out. And I just want to echo that um, really addressing um, us and other universities and higher education, uh, you know, as a whole, addressing the student achievement gap will help uh, address the other ones as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Regent uh, Kenyana. Um, I see no other raised hands. You would agree with that, Mr. Steves? That's correct, Mr. Chair. All right, well, listen, um, I guess uh, uh, presenters, uh, Vice President Go, I, I, what I heard pretty consistently was appreciation for the progress on the climate and the, the, some of the sort of structural uh, things that have been, uh, you know, is very, very uh, strong, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, organization of affinity groups and a community of practice and, you know, a nice progress on, on, uh, on, on surveys. That's all, that's all really good. 
but e equally, I, I, I really heard a desire to see the see the numbers. Um, yeah, I heard from Regent Shu, you know, what are the goals? What's the pipeline look like? I mean, these metrics, I think, are, are, are really important. Uh, for this conversation, and the, the numbers don't the numbers don't lie. So I think the, you know, as we continue to, you know, work on this topic, you know, we'd be uh, very very interested in in uh, in the metrics and and the actions that we're going to take to move them in the right direction. So with that, we'd like to thank you, and uh, for a very good presentation, and uh, um, and we look forward to our continuing discussions in this area. And so with that, with that, we will move on to our, the next item of business. Um, and that is uh, before us to, for a formal review uh, today. And that is um, a resolution related to a fundraising agreement between the University of Minnesota Foundation and M Health Fairview. Um, here to present this item are Jacob Toller, Dean of the Medical School and Vice President for Clinical Affairs. And he is here along with Kathy Schmittelkoffer, President and CEO of the University of Minnesota Foundation. So I'd like to thank both of you for being here. And again, reminder to um, my colleagues, this is a review item today. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Toller and uh, Kathy Schmittelkoffer. Thank you, Chair Powell, Regents, Madam President. It is a true delight to be here today uh, with my colleague to talk to you about the tremendous opportunity for our health system. This goal has long been held by me and the CEO of uh, Fairview, James Herford, to bring together the philanthropy efforts on behalf of our care delivery, delivery system. So the purpose today is uh, to present to you that M Health Fairview is to unite the strength of the academic institution, the faculty practice plan, and a community health system to accelerate the missions of all three. And we serve Minnesota with your guidance, but we also work every day to advance the standards of care and change medicine. As some of you have pointed out in the previous presentations, nationally, internationally forever, as you have done and your predecessors and guided us since that glorious day in April in 1888. No one is satisfied. No one should be satisfied with how healthcare is today. And our challenge as a medical school, as a and physician's practice, as a university, as a healthcare system is to take what we have today, which is fragmented, expensive, inequitable healthcare, and use our science, the, the, the R&D, the IP at the university, the science, the education bandwidth, and I would argue bioethical values to frame its new version, a new version of healthcare that's gonna be proactive, flexible, and bespoke where cardinal virtues of medicine, which I consider to be creativity, communication, integrity, empathy, grace under pressure, are made visible and useful to all Minnesotans. And that's what the block M means. That's one of the most, is perhaps the most, the most powerful brand in the state of Minnesota. What it means is what some of you have helped me understand and crystallized my education about it in how it is essential for equity of healthcare for diagnostic reasoning, for mobile and telehealth ability to deliver healthcare to rural Minnesota, to greater Minnesota, how to harness, not forage, but harness the power of the digital bandwidth, the artificial intelligence and machine learning in something that would create a service, a, a healthcare that everybody wants and this high definition in all its aspects and very, very much uh, focused on the patient herself. And the brand, of course, has the power because we deliver on it. And the fundraising under that brand, under that collaboration brand, will benefit the medical school because we do need a strong 
healthcare system that continues to be differentiated from the complex, as you know, crowded market. And, you know, it's filled with friendly rivals and uh, unfriendly competitors. And uh, that tension is, in my opinion, creating a better healthcare for people, but we really need to be intentional about that. Next slide, please. So we are working every day to create a truly academic healthcare system where the academic physician leadership is permeated throughout. The service line system that we have put together uh, with James is beginning to gain authority. We have a chief academic officer. We have a chief quality officer in place. We have vice presidents of operations. And we do have that, uh, that are important part of the equation, which is the personal professional relationship uh, with James Herford. And it is almost a twinning of minds, I think. It is his capacity for brilliance and his ability to think uh, in almost 360 degrees. And uh, at the same time, never hesitate in the academic support for the medical school, for the practice and his, uh, our you know, shared vision that then motivates the faculty, which is highly engaged now and, uh, and really ready, poised you know, to, to deliver you know, on what has been, I think, shown to all of us with the COVID-19 response that we were able to, uh, to deliver to the state, to the university, to our colleagues, to our patients, to our families, and in many ways to ourselves, because we will be defined by this year as, uh, as probably not very many others that I remember in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the past decade. So the piece that we are looking for your support is to add a unified fundraising to accelerate achievement of this vision. UMF is well positioned to lead this activity as uh, they know well academic medicine. Uh, Patty Porter, Kathy middle Koffer, all their teams as I have known them for nearly three decades now, uh, you advocate for academic in academic medicine. They have a track record of success in medicine and health. You have seen the Children's Hospital. You have seen the Masonic Institute for Developing Brain. You have seen the Masonic Cancer Center, the medical discovery teams, the network of cancer trials that we have around the state. There are many, many examples of how we have been able in that partnership to forge the future. Uh, because otherwise, you know, it would be a, it would have been decided for us. So we own that journey, and uh, we share it together. Next slide. The scope of uh, this proposed work is on is in front of you now. You know, this is really truly all that is inside of that intersection of these two circles of that Venn diagram of the joint clinical enterprise that includes capital includes programs in the hospital and outpatient clinics, includes patient care, and again, includes a very intentional, very diligent, very disciplined attention to health equity, to access, to really make this work for people rather than to see the customers of healthcare, what it is today, which is insurance companies. It's really not the patients, it's really not you know, <coughs> the patients, it is, uh, it is somebody else. And uh, the, uh, the, the work, uh, the proposal here in front of you is to be additive to what has been done. It will not detract from the goals of the medical school. And uh, James and I will work together to uh, frame the uh, fundraising priorities for the Joint Clinical Enterprise with the UMF, of course. And uh, we know we can do this because we've done this. You know, we've been successful across Fairview UMP and the medical school in prioritizing the areas that you asked us to prioritize, which is uh, neuroscience, cancer, bioengineering, and really uh, not just in a, in a cloudy concept, but as <clears throat> Paul, you say, you know, in a, in a measurable way, in a, in a way that we can transmute the strategy into measurable tactics. Next slide, please. So these goals are bold, you know, they are supposed to be. If it were easy, you know, anybody can do it. If we don't have the ambition, we would be failing on the task that you put in front of us. 
Uh, they are critically important to the state of Minnesota. They all require uh, investment. They have been, uh, you know, difficult. You know, of course it is because you know that's that's how things are. Diversified portfolio is necessary, and philanthropy is a necessary, in my point, uh, in my opinion, part of what we need to assemble to really be uh, resource, resourceful, resilient, ready. And um, with the glorious uh, leadership of President Gable that, as uh, she said at the beginning, is to keep us safe and successful, we are the fiduciaries of health in the state of Minnesota. And we are, uh, we own that challenge and that, that, that incredible uh, challenge for this decade to, uh, to move from, from therapies and uh, from interventions to restoration of health and the uh, medical school, any medical school that is as ambitious as ours, needs a healthcare system to succeed and the healthcare system ber bears our name and must succeed. And significant philanthropy is a critical part of how we will do this. So I look to all 12 of you for guidance and insight and support. And now it's my pleasure to turn over the details to CEO, Kathy Schmidl-Koffer. Okay, thank you, Dr. Toller. Uh, Kathy, uh, over to you. Kathy, you are muted. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair Powell, members of the board. President Gable. Uh, thank you, Dean Toller. Um, I'd also like us to just go to the next slide if I could. Thank you. Um, this slide really um, um, outlines for um, um, all of you as uh, Dean Toller um, has expressed uh, the foundation's capability uh, in this space and how we are well positioned to serve as a sole fundraising uh, foundation uh, for M Health uh, going forward. Um, I think Dean Tiller did a nice job of, of giving you all examples over the last number of years. Uh, some of the major gifts we have brought in for the healthcare system, um, as well as um, our track record um, and our talented team um, and their knowledge and relationships that they have built uh, throughout the medical enterprise. Um, as we started this discussion uh, with the Fairview Foundation, with Fairview leadership, with medical school leadership, as well as foundation leadership, um, and really taking this next step in terms of the strategy on philanthropy as we think about the mHealth Fairview process, we did engage an outside consultant uh, to really determine which organization was going to be able to serve uh, the mHealth Fairview partnership and grow philanthropy with it in the future. Things that uh, came out uh, strong and clear besides the track record of our team, the talent of our team is the efficient uh, cost to raise a dollar that UMF also presents in the space, um, much more efficient than the Fairview Foundation today. Um, so a lot of things align to say that the University of Minnesota Foundation and our medicine and health team um, are ready to go and serve the mHealth Fairview partnership. Next slide. So we have been really pleased to be asked by Dean Toller to expand our development expertise to, entire, to the entire joint clinical enterprise. Um, as you know, we take pride in raising private support to advance the university's healthcare enterprise in any way we can. And we understand so keenly how our healthcare enterprise is a critical, important component of the university's broad mandate to improve the lives of Minnesota and advance knowledge for all. Um, I want to highlight a little bit about the philanthropic agreement, but more importantly, talk about how important the strategy is. I first know that there are three parties to the philanthropic agreement, the university's medical school, uh, Fairview, and the University of Minnesota Foundation. And leaders from each area have worked collaboratively to agree upon the terms included in the draft philanthropic agreement. And we really look forward to finalizing this agreement in the weeks to come. The key principles in the document are highlighted on the slide, so I'm not going to go through them indiv individually, um, but I will just say that the major terms of the agreement are grounded in a few fundamentals. 
First of all, shared priority settings and a shared funding model were a key element among the partners. And we all agreed that fundraising will be for research and programs and capital, all of the margin of excellent type of fundraising that is compelling to our donors. And it's specifically not fundraising to fill operational budget deficits or fund basic or ongoing operations of the J JCE. And finally, I think it's important to note that the term of the philanthropic agreement aligns with the term of the M Health Fairview Master Agreement. But more important, I want to take a moment to convey the strategic opportunity that we see in serving as the sole fundraising entity for M Health Fairview. First, raising money for the entire M Health Fairview partnership allows for increased development of big aspiration goals for philanthropy and has the potential to significantly increase grateful patient prospects and thereby increasing gift production for the university. And second, we see the ability to leverage the healthcare story with our donors across the bench to bedside continuum. And when we can bring the entire continuum to our donors, we have greater success. Let me bring this concept to life through a few examples, such as we raise money for pediatric research and the Children's Hospital. We raise money for cardiovascular research and the new mobile echo vehicles serving those rural areas for people experience heart attack and strokes. We raise money for basic cancer research, which is now in the clinical trials across the state. And lastly, there are many operational advantages to have a sole fundraising entity supporting the M Health Fairview partnership. It ensures all fundraising for the university brand is managed by UMF, thus eliminating any donor confusion than if multiple fundraising organizations and messages were involved. For me personally, it enhances career opportunities for UMF staff and, and then really increases my opportunity to retain and recruit top development talent in the medicine and health area. And lastly, it establishes a business model that fully supports our medicine and health fundraising, its future growth, and at a scale that's gonna help us drive even further efficiencies. So you can see why both the staff at the foundation and the board of trustees are supportive of expanding our scope of fundraising to the entire JCE. Next slide, please. So the board resolution for your view uh, was also in your docket. In summary, I, I will summarize kind of four key points. First of all, the resolution acknowledges the strong track record of UMF and fundraising for the university's medicine and health enterprise. It affirms that fundraising for the JCE benefits the medical school and the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs and is therefore consistent with UMF's mission to operate exclusively for the benefit of the University of Minnesota. It states that Dean Toller is requesting UMF to expand our scope to include the entire JCE and it delegates the authority to President Gable and to Dean Toller to enter into a philanthropic agreement with UMF and Fairview. So on behalf of Dean Toller and I, we appreciate your time today to review this important opportunity that allows for a strategic next step in the M Health Fairview partnership, that of philanthropy. So Chair Powell, that concludes our formal remarks. And I know Dean Toller and I would be happy to answer any questions or listen to any comments you may have. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Toller and, and uh, Kathy Schmidlkoffer for this, uh, this overview of the proposal. Um, I see a few, a, a number of hands uh, up now, uh, and let me sort of, while we're waiting for more to show, um, let me ask a, a question. And, you know, given that um, M Health Fairview is, is is itself a going, you know, a going concern, if you will, and, and as is UMP, and then we have sort of the academic, you know, mission of the University of Minnesota. Um, and, and, but M Health Fairview with its own, you know, statement of revenue and operating results and its own balance sheet. I mean, the question that I have is um, who, to, for instance, in the case of a major equipment purchase um, th that your team uh, develops the funds for, who, 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 who would own that? Uh, Chair Powell, uh, a great question. Great question indeed. And uh, I will uh, let uh, our legal colleagues to define, you know, what is the ability to, uh, to end this arrangement if this were, you know, the implicit part of that question has been. And uh, I can assure you that the agreement uh, timelines, they align with the definitive agreement that you and the, and the board um, 
approved and the uh, and the UMF cannot be obligated without the rest of the UMP and the university uh, and the and the and the medical school. On the particulars, you know, of the of the equipment and uh, you know who owns this, the, this really is uh, all tied into the uh, the programming and the uh, the the you know the the parts of the operations that we need to elevate to the point of the excellence that we seek and the scale that we seek. Uh, I will now ask if I can, you know, uh, if I have a legal support, you know, that can define a little better, you know, for you, what are the specific legal obligations in that case? Yes, that would be helpful. Are you referring to OGC or? Um, I think either uh, uh, General Counsel Peterson or perhaps the General Counsel of the UMP Bishop, you know, either one of them would be uh, would be very well um, equipped to answer the question. Well, who wants to jump in on that one? We have uh, General Counsel Peterson coming up to the table. Thank you, General Counsel Peterson. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Powell. Um, as a, um, a general comment, um, I really endorse what Dean Tolar said, that is that the agreement is designed to coordinate with the definitive agreements and its timetable. So um, those are in sync. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, the the donations and how they square up with you know the various entities and the balance sheets of those entities um, i think what the agreement is grounded in is that um, there's a real respect for donors that run through this that um, it's really um, the intent of the donors that is designed to um, uh, be respected in terms of determining sort of how um, donors wish their dollars to land. And so built into the agreement is the um, understanding that um, the more complicated relationship between you know, the entities involved will need to be discussed kind of with donors so that they're aware of that dimension and that they then can make their choice in terms of um, where they'd like their dollars placed and ultimately um, you know, where that might appear on the balance sheet of a particular entity that may be the beneficiary of it um, in the long term, even though clearly it's designed to kind of benefit the M Health Fairview partnership that has been built up in a very collaborative way. But at the same time, everybody's mindful that there's some particulars that uh, donors will be interested in as well. So hopefully that sufficiently responds to your question, Chair Paul. Uh, it does, and we'll move on to the other questioners. Now, you might want to stay in place, General Counsel, in case there are other questions for you. But I see a number of hands up now, and we'll go to Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Tolar and, uh, and uh, our, our leadership at, uh, at UM, UMF. I have had the good fortune to be connected in one way or another with the evolution of the M Health concept. I don't know, it's seven years now, I think, that when, since it first came as an idea to the board, and, and it doesn't matter when, whether it was six, seven, it's a long time. And the path to the M Health Fairview um, outcome that, uh, that we realized ultimately was circuitous at best and challenging. But one theme that, that stuck through that, and I remember hearing about it very distinctly long ago, was that we could be better together in this philanthropic space. And I know it's been challenging to get to this point, but that goal has always been out there. And I just want to say, I think that, that what we see today is extremely well thought through and probably better because of the starts and stops and changes and turns and detours that have occurred on the path to this point. So it looks to me like most of, if not all of, or as many as possible of the types of issues that come up in a joint setting like this 
have been thought through and I really appreciate the prioritization that I hear about UMF and its focus on supporting the university. And I don't mean that to the exclusion of Fairview or anything else. I just always appreciate when our sister organizations like this, um, you know, state at the outset that we exist to support this purpose and uh, this adventure, this venture that we're gonna launch now is in furtherance of that. So I see all of that and I'm mostly just saying thank you to people who had the perseverance and the vision to recognize what long ago was held up as we can do a better job of philanthropy for all for both of these or all these systems, the JCE now as we call it, but we didn't know what it would be six, seven years ago. So reaching fruition today is great. I don't have any specific questions. I appreciated Chair Powell's. Those are the types of things that have to be thought through ahead of time or you get into them and it's like you wonder, well, how did we get here? So I feel like the prep work's been ex extensive and the uh, documentation has been thoughtful and uh, I'm very pleased to see us at this point. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you. We'll, we'll move now, uh, turn to uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, presenters. Um, I'm gonna um, echo Regent McMillan's comments to some degree. Um, as one of, your, one of your designees on the University of Minnesota Foundation, I've had the, um, the benefit of watching this issue develop and to see the care and professionalism that uh, has been used in, in, in trying to craft uh, an agreement. This could have devolved into a turf battle, um, but instead everyone took the high road. And um, at the end of the day, um, we are going to, what I call found money, new money. This is going to result in new resources to, to the whole enterprise. And it's a, it is a not unimportant benefit of the whole M health model that we've created. Uh, and I'm very excited for um, that and appreciate the work that everybody's done on the uh, Fairview side and the, 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 the foundation side and the medical school side. It's very exciting, so thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a, a couple basic questions. One is uh, the term was referenced as the same term as the master agreement. What is that exactly? What is the term? Chair Paul. Um, yes, Dr. Toller, I think that one's to you. Well, I, I think it, it, even better, I'm going to use the, the phenomenal <laughs> supratentorial power of the general counsel to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Regent Shu. I'm not um, having in mind how the term master agreement was referenced before. Um, Dean Tolar, maybe I need to kick it back to you because as I understood it, you were speaking in terms of our set of definitive agreements? Is that the reference we're speaking of? Herr Paul, yes, that, that is the reference. You know, this is the 2023-2026 cascade. Back to you, General Counsel. Yeah, so, so, with, so with that, I mean, I think that's back to the notion that um, this is being designed to be sort of in sync with the definitive agreements that were approved by the Board of Regents. Um, you know, recently, and um, you know, if I could comment maybe more broadly here, um, you know, this pandemic that everybody's working through um, brings home to me the importance of what had been an open issue, you know, back in 2016 and 2017. It's sort of the value of having kind of talked this through in a collaborative fashion. And I think everybody's learning that, um, you know, while everybody had a lot of difficult choices to make in terms of how the joint clinical enterprise would be constructed, that um, our, we're learning that our collaboration with Fairview is something that we need now more than ever. And likewise with philanthropy, um, this is a time of, of need and we need this um, cooperation and, uh, the energy of the foundation on on this endeavor now um, more than ever. So, um, you know, these agreements have 
have been designed with that in mind? Uh, Regent Shu, does that? I mean, I think we're saying it's the 23 kind of is the is the option to renew, and 26 would be the you know expiration. Is that the information you're looking for? Yes, Mr. Chair. I just didn't know why that wasn't referenced explicitly in the presentation, so I had to ask the question. Um, the The question I have, I mean, obviously this um, the situation that we have. Um, um, requires a decision to be made in 2023, which is kind of right around the corner, although a couple of years out. Um, and this this whole concept made a lot more sense um, during the Fairview, what I'll call the Fairview One discussions that were you know, happening in 2015, 2016, um, and maybe 2017. And ultimately we end up going, ended up going into a different direction, which kind of creates a, a little bit more difficulty uh, in in making this happen now. Uh, so I, I just would I'm interested in hearing more about this. And um, you know I, I also question why uh, the board wouldn't um, you know since we're going to be making the decision whoever's on the board on twenty in 2023 um, why we wouldn't want to um, actually have approval over this instead of delegating it um, uh, at the current time. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. Um, Regent Anderson. Okay, I'm unmuted so I can talk. Um, well, from this, I'll just tell you, from this grateful patient at the University of Minnesota Hospitals, I think that uh, M Health has been a successful journey from from my point of view, getting to that that point with Fairview. Uh, my question comes, and it probably is addressed to uh, Ms. Schmittelkoffer. As far as I can go back on UMF, it seems that we're very, very good as a, as a 501c3 in raising money. It looks like 15 years and maybe even longer, it's been constant at about 13 cents on the dollar. It costs us 13 cents to raise a dollar. Although we've had an advantage of being the only land-grant college in the state, that is an advantage. Can you, can you tell me in your pro formas moving forward when there's so many competing hospital systems, can we continue to raise money at that 13 cents on a dollar area, even going through competing with some of these other systems? I guess that's my question. Chair Powell, uh, Regent Anderson, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think there's every reason to believe that in, um, within degrees that we can keep our cost to raise a dollar efficient in that 13 to 14 uh, cents uh, per dollar as we go forward. Um, our goal is obviously to continue to raise gift production faster than we're raising expenses. Um, I do know that if we look back over the last 20 years, we have more than quadrupled gift production and our cost to raise a dollar has remained flat and consistent in that 12 to 14 cent range. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I just, best of luck and, and uh, I think we have the right people in place to get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, uh, Regent Anderson, uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Powell, and thank you, Dean Toller and CEO Schmerkopper. Um, I also support the agreement I applaud the goals and agree with the opportunities that are presented. And in terms of philanthropy and a little bit maybe piggybacks on your comment, Regent Anderson, is that I see this really enabling uh, donors to achieve their personal giving goals and a means uh, for them to present their proudest gift. So I think this is great collaboration. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Regent Davenport. We'll, we'll move now to uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, like Regent Beeson, I think like you know, many members of the board over time, I've been uh, very fortunate um, to have a chance to, to uh, observe the <clears throat> operations of the foundation uh, by virtue of my chair position on, on audit for us um, and, and then participating in the audit committee meetings of the foundation and, you know, it's a First rate operation, very, very impressive um, and very well run. I don't think that's a, a question. I, 
Um, I, I have a, I do have a couple questions as we're, you know, moving through this in preparation for, uh, for next month. Um, and actually Regent Powell right out of the shoot was, was on the, the, the question uh, that I wanted to ask. And I, I didn't quite get as the, the level of comfort that I think he did or not comfort, but, um, uh, certainty and in, in the answer that was provided as far as, you know, who owns the, the, the property. Um, here's, you know, here's the, the questions that I'm going to have as we, as we proceed to, uh, the consideration of this, um, of this enterprise, um, is, you know, one is that I, I'm trying to, I, I, if, if, if we could get a clarification, whether it's from general counsel's office or, or uh, the presenters, um, I'm, I'm going back to the mission of the foundation being dedicated to the, to serving the university. Um, and, you know, we can obviously make a lot of secondary arguments about um, if a third party is benefiting, there's a benefit to the university. And um, and I, I understand that in the past, we've had some uh, some of those things with uh, the Children's Health Campaign, Masonic Institute. I'm just not familiar enough with those enterprises to understand how that fits in with the university, how the funding was raised and turned into resources or assets, where the university was in relation to those assets, to our ownership, to our interest. Um, and so I would just, if, if I could get, get a better understanding about how this works, um, <clears throat> because the, the M Health Enterprise is not wholly owned by the university. There's a there's a, you know, this this third entity and then another entity in that relationship. Now I would agree with 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 Regent Anderson that um, I'm very optimistic. I think it's I would describe it as anticipatory success. Um, we're still fairly new into this relationship and 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 whether over time the support that we understood would be coming back to our um, academic health uh, enterprise is you know it, it's still sitting out there and obviously in this very strange time, it's pretty hard to assess what's going on in 2020 against what we would expect um, going on beyond that, assuming the world ever normalizes. Um, and so while I'm very optimistic and supportive of, of that effort in this joint relationship, um, it still is not all the university. And, and, and so to the extent that the foundation's mission is to support the university, I just, I'd like to understand a little bit better about how Funds that would be raised by the by our foundation um, would be creating resources that we would be able to clearly tell the you know the the university community the public um, that we serve as as trustees that it is working to the um, specific interest uh, the direct benefit of the university um, and Regent Beeson talked about you know the the concern about a turf battle I think that's a very fair cons consideration my concern. Um, is that when you do have separate entities, um, as we do with Fairview and the university in, in this relationship with, for M Health, I, I, I would I'm, I'm, I want to be cautious about taking what would be external turf battles and making them internal turf battles. That now that now it's within the within the foundation itself, where you have a substantial gift um, that that a, that a grateful family wants to provide um, for the care that they received you know, there's obviously going to be some, at that point, some interest as to whether it goes to capital resources that would re be retained by the Fair Fairview system if there was ever a parting of ways, um, or, you know, would they be, would, would they be in University of Minnesota resources? And, and the reason I raise that is because when you put University of Minnesota on something and University of Minnesota Foundation, that is a substantial asset. Um, and I, I would imagine any health system would love to have the, the power of the University of Minnesota involved in the efforts to generate uh, philanthropy to support their operations. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be looking for um, between now and, and when this is before us for, for approval um, uh, to understand um, how exactly that works, um, that to ensure that the foundation that's established to serve the University of Minnesota, that's the sole uh, under, that, that's my understanding is that's the sole mission of, of the foundation and that's why the University of Minnesota you know um, applies its name to the foundation um, that when you start to move it into fundraising that would at some point benefit a third entity um, or, or multiple other entities separate from the university itself um, how that works and, and how we reconcile that and, and I'm not saying that it can't be done but that's what I'm, I'm very interested in, in in defending the uh, the mission of the foundation um, and the university's reliance on the foundation to ensure that that the University of Minnesota is its its uh, uh, the, the focus of its mission. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Rocha, for that comment. Um, and I, I see no other hands raised right now, but I, I do uh, know that President Gable uh, would, would also like to comment. And so uh, we'll wait and see if other hands go up. But meanwhile, uh, President Gable, uh, uh, please, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Chair Powell, and uh, thank you, presenters. I just, uh, I wanted to chime in on that very legitimate concern that Regent Rocha has raised. And I, and I think from the, um, from my perspective, both speaking for myself and speaking on behalf of this initiative, which I support, um, I think the question that the um, board needs to ask itself is, do we as the university have to own something in order to benefit from its success? Um, I do think that we need very carefully articulated um, contractual arrangements in order to create clarity around the various things that have already been raised today and probably things that we wouldn't anticipate just in real time, hence the reason why we have such agreements, but that um, the ability of philanthropy and philanthropists to support excellence in healthcare is not something we can do on our own anyway. The only way we can do it is if we have the right partnership with clinical care and delivery that we have um, depth of relationship and that people who are interested in supporting excellence in health sciences, which is fundamental to our strategic plan, which is um, um, a long standing strain of excellence um, for this institution in particular as compared to others uh, requires that we have a clinical partner and that we don't have our philanthropic partners having to choose between us. So while I do absolutely agree that we need to be very thoughtful and purposeful about the underlying legal arrangements, um, we do not, in this case, not in my opinion, have to own it in order to benefit from its success or it, from support of it. Thank you, President Cable. Um, I see one more hand and then we'll, we'll close this off. Uh, Regent McMillan, you'll, you'll wrap it up for us. Thank you, Chair Powell, for the opportunity to again jump in. I got the opportunity to open us following your question, but your question, um, the general counsel's response, Regent Rocha's comment, and now President Gable's comment, lead me to add a, a more, I was very optimistic in my opening comments and I remain that. I believe that this is well thought out and that, the, all, that there's a lot of good to come from this. And as I think about this though, and Regent Shu helped me think a little bit about this too. I think what we need in these documents without infusing them with a sense of you know, despair or pessimism is linkage to those 2023, 2026 decisions that enable an unwind if we have to. And I don't think we're gonna have to, but um, we don't want to further complicate the already insanely complicated rela legal relationship that exists. And of course, the underlying asset, the hospital, is uh, what drives some of the timing around the long-term mHealth piece. So let me just be very clear. I am very optimistic, and I believe that there is all upside from this. And I believe that the team has thought through the downsides, but to the extent the legal side of this can keep a pathway open in the event we do have to separate ways that isn't further complicated by now, you know, jointly owned assets or or joint funds that are part Fairview M Health, part UMP, part, you know, whatever, that'll be helpful and it won't make this, you know, uh, an unlikely but still potentially possible separation that much harder. So um, I'm just building on some of the thoughts others have said, and I didn't want mine to, my comments to be like, there's absolutely no way this couldn't work out, but uh, I believe it will. I just think we need to think ahead to those 2020s, to that 2026 timeframe and uh, build that into the agreements to the extent that's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Okay, well, that, that, that'll that wrap it up for us. And I, I J Dr. Toller and uh, 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 President Schmilkoffer, thank you both for presenting uh, today. I, th I think it's clear that the board appreciates the, 
you know, the the sort of potential and the promise of this idea, you know, as something that would strengthen our ability to reach uh, the goals that Dr. Toller, you know, so eloquently articulated. But there are some questions on the kind of the governance and the guidelines of how this would work. And we want to make sure it's fully on mission for the foundation. So, I mean, I think that came through pretty clear. And I think if you can work on that, uh, you know, between uh, now and then, uh, you know, that will really help the uh, our, our the discussion at the next board meeting. So thanks. Thanks to both of you. And uh, we'll move on now to our next our next item. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so Kathy, don't go too far. Our next item will be a report on private giving and an update uh, on the driven campaign uh, from Kathy and from uh, two of our very favorites, uh, John and uh, Nancy. Before we do that, though, and in order for this report to have the full attention of the board, uh, I'm going to call a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back at exactly 1130. John and Nancy, you've been very patient, but I think we do need a break now. And uh, so uh, we'll take that. We'll reconvene at uh, right on 1130.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, you, you guys can hear me. All right. Yes. Welcome, welcome back. Uh, after following our break, welcome back to all my colleagues and to all of those who are viewing. Uh, we'll move on to our next item, which will continue uh, in a wonderful way on the theme of philanthropy, uh, which is the annual report on private giving and an update on the on the Driven campaign. I'd like to welcome back uh, Kathy Schmittelkoffer, president and CEO of the University of Minnesota Foundation. And she will be joined by the wonderful John and Nancy Lindahl, who have been our absolutely tireless Driven campaign uh, co-chairs co and have been very patiently waiting to give this update. So thanks to all of you for being with us today. President Gable, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your opening comments. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, over the last year, the University of Minnesota Foundation has maintained incredible momentum in continuing to engage with members of the university's philanthropic community, despite the challenges posed by COVID-19. Fiscal year 2020 marks the completion of the ninth year of the 10-year Driven Campaign, which is scheduled to close on June 30, 2021. As of June 30th, this campaign has reached 3.9 billion, and I'm gonna do it once, just because it, I love it so much when Nancy does this. I'm sorry, Nancy. I want you to do it too, but I just have been waiting <laughs> for a chance to do the B uh, and well on pace to reach our $4 billion goal. Thanks to the Lindahls and the entire UMF Foundation team's incredible friendship, leadership, partnership, and work. In fact, in fiscal year 2020, UMF recorded its best year of private gifts to the university with 385 million from 65,662 donors, more than half of which were alums. The two largest areas of support are program support and student support, followed by capital improvements, research, faculty and staff, and then outreach and community engagement. Total private investment in the university also reached a new record of 510 million in fiscal year 2020, making it the first time the $500 million level was surpassed in one year. I want to recognize UMF supports for students and staff throughout the pandemic. They have come through with resources for research, for outreach, and in particular recently with recent efforts to in a very inclusive way establish a George Floyd scholarship. Kathy Schmittelkoffer, UMF president and CEO, and then John and Nancy Lindahl, Driven Campaign co-chairs, are here to provide more detail about their important work and impact over the last year. So at this time, I, Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to them. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you, President Gable. Kathy, John, and Nancy, over to you. Well, thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board, President Gable, the University of Minnesota Foundation. I am so pleased to join you today to highlight the impact of philanthropy and private support at the University of Minnesota. And as you heard to, at, both from uh, Chair Powell and President Gable, I am thrilled to have John and Nancy Lindahl with us today to give you a campaign progress report on our driven campaign. And you're gonna hear from them shortly. So on this solemn 19th anniversary of 9-11, the Duluth's iconic lift bridge bathed in maroon and gold seems a fitting way to begin. In this most unusual and challenging time, our report today is about rising. <coughs> reaching a new high for private giving to the university, raising support for students, our medical and research experts, and Minnesotans as they rise to respond to the pandemic, and helping to drive change as members of the community lift their voices to call for justice and equity. Together we are rising in ways we planned and in ways we've never imagined. Next slide, please. The University of Minnesota Foundation is a nonprofit organization governed by a 43 member board with one quarter of our trustees nominated by the Board of Regents. Three regents and the president currently serve as trustees. So thank you, Regent Anderson, Regent Eastman, Regent McMillan, and President Gable for your tremendous valued service and engagement. The Board of Regents Audit Committee Chair is also a member of the Foundation's Audit Committee. So thank you, Regent Rocha, for your service on this important committee. Our vision is a future transformed by philanthropy, and we work together to change lives and support greatness across the University of Minnesota. We collaborate system-wide to support students, research, and outreach to the community, 
whether we're raising funds for online learning, ship, online learning leadership in Crookston, freshwater research in Duluth, environmental sustainability in Morris, health sciences in Rochester, or engineering, education, medicine, law, or the arts in the Twin Cities. We are also honored to work with donors and volunteers statewide, coast to coast, and across the globe. And speaking of people we are so honored to work with, it's my pleasure to introduce our Driven Campaign co-chairs, John and Nancy Lindell. Thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board, President Gable. Nancy and I are so pleased to share the latest update on the university's Driven Campaign. Our system-wide campaign began in July 11, about 10 years ago. University-wide campaign like ours begin with a planning and leadership phase to engage volunteers and secure early major gifts before launching to the public. We celebrated Ribbon's public launch on the Gateway Plaza three years ago and today we are three months into the final year of the campaign. All of the university's 30 colleges, campuses, and units are part of Driven and all contribute to our $4 billion goal. Next slide, please. The past year, we reached a new high for fundraising, as President Gable indicated at the university, with over 65,000 donors who made more than 134,000 individual gifts totaling over $385 million. Our success is a team effort led by our development professionals, academic leaders, and President Gable. Our team also includes 300 plus campaign volunteers and ambassadors who helped us set a record we are so grateful to all of our generous donors and partners. Since the start of the campaign, more than 250,000 donors have made gifts to the university. And really somewhat more important is that half of those donors are new since the start of the campaign, which really bodes well for the university's future. Uh, next slide, please. Chair Powell, members of the board, President Gable, our record fundraising helped to lift the Driven Campaign to new heights this past year. Since higher education campaigns are about building private investments in the university, all campaign counting includes not only philanthropic gifts, but also the private grants brought in through the research powerhouse of our faculty. This campaign progress chart shows the philanthropic gifts we raised in maroon and the private grants in gold. All in, we received an estimated $510 million, setting a record for private support and investment in this university. Those gifts and grants bring our campaign total to, drum roll, President Gable, I've got to do my B, $3.9 billion with a B, done backwards so you could see it correctly on your screen. Through the end of year nine of our campaign, we have reached 98% of our goal. We are confident that our great momentum will help us cross the finish line before the campaign concludes next June. Thanks to our generous supporters and ambassadors, we are well on our way. Next slide, please. In a typical year, record fundraising results would be our biggest headline, but it's the partnership and resilience behind those numbers that best tell the story of giving in 2020. The fiscal year began with introducing our new president to alumni and longtime partners, business and community leaders, and everyday Minnesotans. We help President Gable meet the many people and organizations across Minnesota and our nation who care about education, research, and our university's future. She quickly saw how this university is deeply woven into what it means to be Minnesotan. President Gable's inauguration blended academic tradition with 
Access for All, streaming live from the steps of Northrop. And of course, a highlight of 2020, I would say the best day of 2020 was seeing our Gopher Nation unite to upset Auburn. And President Gable, yes, we did beat Auburn at the Outback Bowl on New Year's Day. Like you, we look forward to a time when we can come together again to cheer our team and rally our supporters and fans. Next slide, please. The university's longtime visionary partners and supporters helped put us on a path to a record year. Fiscal 2020 results reflect the impact of fostering innovation in interdisciplinary work that attracts the transformative investment needed to move the needle on critical initiatives. The Benson Foundation's gift of $15 million will help to keep the university affordable and accessible for those with the greatest need. The innovative Benson Scholarship Challenge provides a match that encourages donors to create new scholarships for Pell eligible students system-wide and a visionary $35 million gift from the university's largest single donor, Minnesota Masonic Charities, will help us ensure that children have the strongest possible start in life. The new Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain brings together experts from across the university to study how the brain develops in childhood and early adolescence. It has the potential to be a true game changer. When strong partnerships like these remain key to our fundraising success, res resilience played a pivotal role in helping us rise to the challenge when the world as we knew it changed. Next slide. Clearly the video is not going. We did a better job of raising money maybe than technology. <laughs> Kathy? Yeah, I just uh, want to make sure that I'm getting the clue that uh, we'll, we'll keep moving. So the video didn't come through as planned. Um, just, you know, it was a quick reminder of how our community has seen the university at the forefront of research on medical innovation, especially during this pandemic. So I'll keep going. In the face of the pandemic, thank you, we acknowledge the university has been a global leader, bringing together some of our states and world's best minds to find solutions and a path forward. When the team of experts rose to the call for urgently needed care, testing, research, and equipment, so did our donors. In just over seven weeks, we will advocate raise over $8 million to support our medical school dean's emergency fund to respond to the pandemic. Our supporters also step forward to support students and frontline caregivers. We received more than 1,800 gifts to emergency funds set up by President Gable to help those who were most vulnerable during this crisis. And in a minute, we're going to hear from one of those students who benefited from our donors' generosity. Next. Donors once again rose to the call in response to the murder of George Perry Floyd Jr. in May. During his memorial service, universities were asked to create scholarships in his honor to support of efforts to create a more just and equitable world. We will immediately establish a scholarship fund in Mr. Floyd's name to support underrepresented students and those committed to advancing racial justice across our system. We received more than 350 gifts to the fund with a plan to create further awareness of this scholarship this fall and name the first two recipients yes yet this year. The scholarships, other scholarships in George Floyd's honor were also established at the law school and on the Morris and Duluth campuses, drawing more gifts in his memory. We 
We partner with donors to amplify the voices of those calling for change. Get your comments from people making gifts to these funds. So if we could have the next slide. Next slide. There we go. I will give you a few moments to read and reflect on these comments. We always value hearing directly from our donors, and it is so powerful to know what drives our donors to give. Next slide, please. As you all know, the pandemic has shined a light on health disparities in neighborhoods that lack adequate access to care due to longstanding racial and social inequities. Through a visionary gift, the Otto Bremer Trust is helping the university to quickly establish mobile health care services in these areas bringing together professionals from our medicine, dentistry, nursing, pharmacy, and veterinary medicine programs to deliver desperately needed care. Private support is also lifting up committed leaders such as Professor, Professor Rachel Hardiman in our School of Public Health. For the past several years, she has rolled up her sleeves to name and confront racism's impact in areas like maternal and infant health, medical education, and burnout among resident physicians of color. This summer, her leadership was recognized when she was named the first Blue Cross Endowed Professor of Health and Racial Equity. As Dr. Hardman says, while titles alone don't create change, the resources, the institutional support, and the right people to lead the work do. I think we all agree that these examples of targeted support could not be more timely. We are committed to continuing to drive meaningful change through partnerships with our generous donors. Next slide, please. If the past year has taught us anything, it's that none of us knows what awaits us over the next rise. In fiscal 2020, the foundation began work on its five-year strategic plan for the system-wide development enterprise, not realizing that our next five-year journey would take place in a role that has much changed. A number of you are part of that collaborative process to develop this plan, which we're happy to report was approved by the Board of Trustees last month and our strategic plan is purposely aligned to support the university's new system-wide strategic plan and commitments. We recognize that we must build on our successes, meet future challenges, and embrace opportunities, both those we can foresee and those that are gonna surprise us. We are preparing for the journey from where we sit today to be ready for what tomorrow might bring. And as Nancy said earlier, we do feel confident, confident that our campaign goal is well within sight this fiscal year. However, in general, we are forecasting a challenging year ahead in private giving, but we are committed to leaning in and listening, remaining nimble, and rising to meet our supporters and communities where they are. Next slide, please. As we close, thank you for the opportunity to provide a campaign update and the latest record results of giving to the university. Just as we each gift and its individual impact we value each of you as a regent and the individual impact, your partnership and dedication to this great institution, the University of Minnesota. Thank you for the work you do. As we reflect on the past year and look to the future, there's nothing that makes us more hopeful than listening to our students. We've watched the world change and we celebrated partnerships that have helped us adjust and push forward. <coughs> students at the University of Minnesota have also courageously pushed forward, demonstrated admirable ability to adapt and thrive. In the face of uncertainty, our students remain determined to succeed, to make a difference, and to rise to whatever their future may bring with gratitude and hope. This closing video spotlights just one example of the power of philanthropy to dramatically change the course of a student's life. Please roll the video. I okay, so well, despite our technical challenges with the video, I want to tell you some of what you would have heard from this incredible student. 
Naftali was only a month away from graduation this past spring when the pandemic hit. And as a result, she lost her campus job and her research opportunity. She had no way to pay for Wi-Fi or the textbooks she normally used at the library, which was closed. Finishing a degree without her income felt impossible. But a grant of just $800 from the Student Emergency Fund changed everything for Naftali. She became a person in her extended family to graduate high school and college, something that she told us that would have never been possible without that $800. She told us that our donors and supporters have truly been part of her family history now. They came here from 20 years ago, and she knows that her story is a great testament to what can happen in just one generation. We'll send you the video link after the meeting so you can hear from Natalia yourself in her own words. But her journey is a poignant reminder that beyond the numbers and the data, our success is found in stories like these. Stories that are being written every day by the work we do at the University of Minnesota. Together, we are making a difference in the lives of our students and the broader community. Together, we are rising. So once again, on behalf of the foundation and the entire university development community, thank you for your commitment to the University of Minnesota. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our report today. And at this time, Chair Powell, we're happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. All right, Th thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you, John and Nancy. Um, I just wanna make a few comments while I, I see a few hands uh, being raised here. But uh, first of all, please do um, uh, share the, uh, the videos, uh, Kathy, that I think we would very much like to see those. And so if the link can be forwarded, um, we would, I, I know that we would all like to look at both of those that we were not able to look at today. And then I just want to say, um, uh, John and Nancy, to you, I, I so regret, you know, that this particular conversation is happening, uh, you know, through, through Zoom. We would, we would just wish we could, you know, be there with you and thank you, you know, in person and one day it will happen. <laughs> But uh, you, you have, you guys are just, uh, you're, you've just given so much of your time and your talent and your influence and your, your personal treasure. We are, we are so grateful to you. And, you know, what's even better is that we know that the next report is going to begin with a F, four with an F. <laughs> but, so we're, we're really, really grateful uh, to for everything that you've done and look look forward to you know saying so face to face. So I see a few I see a few thank hands you. up. Thank you, Chairman Paul. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Th thank it's been you. Been our humble honor. Well, it's just uh, you think about the impact that you've had. You're gonna have you know for generations of kids you know come who are going to attend this institution and it's just wonderful. So I see uh, I see a few hands up. I'm going to uh, turn now to uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, from my perch uh, uh, on the foundation board, um, I saw firsthand the, the mobilization of this campaign. There is so much planning, there's so much work, there's expense. Um, this is a, we're in campaign season, but this, this campaign, <clears throat> campaign we all could get behind and people did through their votes and uh, voting with, uh, with their donations. John, Nancy, thank you. This was on the heels of the TCF Bank Stadium fundraising <laughs> campaign. So they had a very short break <laughs> and then they jumped back in. And John, even though I asked you not to retire from your day job, you have, it does open up more time for volunteering <laughs> as we go forward. Oh, good. <laughs> Boy, and We've got, I'm sure Kathy's got plans for use of your <laughs> time along with the president. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Thanks, Regent. Uh, Regent Rocha. Th Thank you, Mr. Chair. And on the heels of Regent Beeson's comments, I, you know, I would, I would add to the, the, the um, legend of John and Nancy Lindahl that, that their service to the university started long before this campaign. And, <laughs> and I, I've known of them for decades and, was honored to have met them many years ago as they were already at that point in time leaders. And, and I would uh, draw attention to our earlier conversation about, uh, about the uh, uh, description of the, of, for, for potential candidates to the Board of Regents. We were talking a lot about how much time it takes. 
I would point out that it, it, there is a ceiling somewhere below the John and Nancy Lindahl standard for time contributed <laughs> to the University of Minnesota, uh, even serving on this board. It's just absolutely amazing what you do and, and you know, thousands and thousands, in fact, millions of people benefit from your efforts and they will never maybe know your name or know that, that you, you played this role, but just like, uh, you, you know, you look to the heavens in your favorite park and thank the people that had the foresight to create it a hundred years ago, what you're doing now will change lives for, for uh, centuries, uh, frankly. And, and so thank you for that. I also, I'm, I'm so impressed with this foundation, um, you know, for, for those that, you know, because, because the board is a bit of a parade as we come through, um, you know, Minnesota started a little late to the foundation world, I think, from, from uh, compared to some of our uh, peers. And, and yet here we are among one of the very best in, in our endowment has, has really esta been established as one of the top public endowments in the nation. And that's such a credit to the people that have have been a part of it and, and certainly no crew better than the crew that we have right now. So thank you to Director Schmittelkoffer um, and to all of the other folks that are part of the UMF staff. Uh, but again, uh, John and Nancy, thank you very much on behalf of myself, my children, and hopefully my grandchildren someday. So thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Regent Rosha. Uh, Regent Shu. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John and Nancy. Um, we really appreciate everything you've done, and we look forward to the next one, which is uh, four, four or five years. Take a break. We'll see you in four or five years. Thanks. All right. Uh, Mr. Steves, I, I don't see any other hands on my screen uh, from your end. Do you, uh, do you have uh, anybody who would? Oh, I see, I, I see uh, Regent McMillan. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. And, and um, really quickly, John and Nancy and Kathy and the entire team at UMF, you, you make us so proud. <clears throat> I had the good fortune and one of the highlights of my service on this board to walk out of the McNamara boardroom down the elevator and stand on the out on the uh, the plaza that day and uh, and be part of the public launch with. Uh, with you both, John and Nancy, then uh, President Kaler and a lot of other people. And it's just, it's humbling to uh, see what you've accomplished and the other regents have already spoke to your personal commitment, but organizationally you've helped uh, Kathy lead, lead us to this time. And uh, boy, what a celebration next year. I hope we can have, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Steves, do you, uh, are you see anyone, do you see anyone else? <laughs> No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, all right, thank you. Kathy, great to hear this report. John and Nancy, always always a great pleasure. Um, best, best wishes, Godspeed as we go into the last year, which I know is gonna be a huge success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we turn now to item nine. <clears throat> and this of course is the uh, very important uh, item involving uh, Gopher athletics. Um, I, I think we all know uh, the, the, these very difficult conditions that we face, uh, and they're requiring, uh, you know, very challenging and very significant changes. And uh, they, there's some very painful decisions that are uh, being proposed by Gopher athletics today. Uh, obviously, the hope and the belief is that those will position. Uh, go for athletics to best serve our student athletes and staff members uh, going forward for many years to come. So we're going to have an, a very important conversation next. Uh, just very specifically uh, to remind uh, my colleagues, we have two resolutions before us. Uh, the first is the resolution related to Twin Cities Campus Athletics personnel cost savings. And this resolution is before us for review and action today. And then the second is a resolution related to the elimination of select Twin Cities campus athletic sports programs. And that resolution will be for review today. To walk us through these resolutions, we'll be joined by Gopher Athletics Director Mark Coyle and Deputy Athletic Director Rhonda McFarland. Before I turn it over to them, I know that President Gable wants to provide introductory comments, and so we'll, we'll, we'll turn it now to President Gable. Thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board. The challenges posed by COVID-19 are, as we know, complex and difficult, and in some ways, uniquely difficult for Gopher Athletics. 
Uh, before I begin my short remarks, I do want to give my sincerest thanks and appreciation to Athletic Director Mark Coyle, Deputy Director Rhonda McFarlane, and the entire team over at Gother Athletics for their work during this crisis, including how they've really done an amazing job supporting the health and wellness of our student athletes, our coaches and staff. This is a hard time for everyone, but there are unique challenges that they face and they have more than risen to the occasion. But members of the board, even with that effort, we still come before you with two recommendations today that reflect the reality that significant change is needed to create stability in Gopher Athletics. These recommendations follow important cost-saving measures undertaken by Gopher Athletics since March to address their budget shortfall. First, for your review this month and for your action in October, we're recommending broad workforce actions for Gopher Athletics from October 2020 through the end of the fiscal year. Athletic Director Mark Coyle and Deputy Director Rhonda McFarland are here to walk you through this, which will include amongst other components, appointment reductions and furloughs. The second proposed item is a recommendation of the elimination of four sports programs at the end of their competitive seasons, men's gymnastics, tennis, indoor track and outdoor track. These changes will help address the financial challenges facing Gopher Athletics and help ensure continued Title IX compliance with respect to the department's participation numbers. A.D. Coyle and his team will provide more detail into these proposed cuts and their respective <clears throat> impacts, which collectively across the two proposals represent several million dollars in savings year over year. By any measure, these two recommendations we bring to you today are at a minimum heartbreaking. We recognize and deeply respect the disappointment across Gopher Athletics and beyond as a result of these recommendations and um, what happens upon their uh, approval. It really is, it's very painful. Our student athletes, coaches and staff are an invaluable part of the overall contribution that Gopher Athletics makes, something that I regularly refer to as the front porch of the institution, but we want you to know that we are committed to offering them our full support throughout the process. It's a difficult day, but an important one. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to the team to continue the presentation. Uh, thank you, President Gable. And we'll now turn it over to uh, A.D. Coyle and Deputy Director McFarland. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell and members of the board and President Gable. Uh, before Rhonda and I start our presentation, uh, I would like to take a moment just to recognize uh, our student athletes, our coaches and our staff. Uh, yesterday was a very somber day for our department and we had to have many difficult, difficult conversations. And I hope they all know how thankful I am for how they represent our institution, our department and our state in a first class manner at all times. And again, yesterday was a very difficult day and it impacted lots of people. So with that, uh, I'd like to start our presentation with the next slide, please. As all of you are aware, uh, we have more than 650 student athletes and we have 260 full-time staff members. And as I've talked about before, we continue to be the top public institution in the country with respect to student athlete academic success. Athletically, for the past two years, we have finished in the top 20 of the Director's Cup, which measures overall athletic achievement, which puts us in the top 10% in the country. And as I shared with you at the May board meeting, uh, when our seasons came to a dramatic halt because of the pandemic, nine of our teams were ranked in the top 25. Next slide. If you recall at that May board meeting, Rhonda and I discussed with you three different scenarios. The first one was a 10 million potential revenue loss in FY21. That assumed that we returned to playing with fans in our stadium, but we knew we would still have a financial hit. The second model was a $30 million loss in potential revenue. And that model had a scenario where we were allowed to have limited fans in our stadium. And the third scenario was a $75 million potential loss in revenue. And that's where we find ourselves today 
with the proponent of fall sports. The challenges are faced across the Big Ten. All of us have seen Wisconsin, Ohio State, Michigan, Nebraska, all with $100 million or greater in revenue loss. Iowa, Purdue, and others are facing anywhere between 50 to $100 million in revenue loss. In other peer institutions across the country, the similar A5 institutions like us are facing these same daunting challenges. Next slide. We have shared this with you multiple times, but I think it is critically important that we share it with you again and we reiterate what our revenue streams are. And if you look across the Autonomy Five, our peers in the Big Ten, the SEC, the Pac-12, the ACC, and the Big 12, we all have very similar revenue streams. That first revenue stream is our Big Ten and NCAA distribution. The Big Ten distribution obviously comes from our media partnerships. Our NCAA distribution comes from March Madness. Our second revenue bucket is our ticket sales. Those are tickets that we sell for football, both basketball programs, both hockey programs, volleyball, soccer, softball, baseball, et cetera. Our third bucket is the Golden Gopher Fund and our fundraising efforts. That group is responsible for generating over $35 million a year in gifts and in scholarship seating and other gifts to our program. The next bucket is sponsorships. And that is our partnership with Gopher Sports Properties, which as we shared with you before is one of the top uh, agreements in the country with respect to our sponsorship rights. And then our final revenue bucket is our licensing, concession and rental revenue. Next slide, please. Rhonda. Chair Powell and members of the board, as Mark shared, given the information that we know now, we are projecting a $75 million loss of revenue when compared to a more typical year. This slide represents how much of that $75 million revenue disruption is coming from the different revenue buckets we described scenario we use to create this latest revenue projection includes no revenue being generated by our fall sports. While there are many possible outcomes for our fall sports to compete before the end of the fiscal year, and we very much want our teams to have that opportunity, there is no certainty as to the amount of revenue that might be generated during what could be a shortened football season with very limited or no fans. We have factored in reduced amounts of revenue from the conference and NCAA distributions and ticket sales for winter and spring sports as part of this scenario. Next slide, please. Expenses for fiscal year 2021 can be broken into three major categories. I will outline in the next slide specific actions that have been taken and will be taken if approved that will reduce expenses related to the salaries and benefits category. We have built into the operations category, the savings from the approximately $5 million in budget reductions for our support and support units, and the natural savings from reduced operations that we are expecting this fiscal year. Some of these savings are offset by increased expenses associated with COVID-19, testing, enhanced cleaning, and additional supervision to ensure that protocols are being followed. The final category makes up about 38% of our overall expense budget and includes those expenses that we don't have the ability to reduce. Scholarships, annual debt service, facilities costs, and the athletics contribution to the university cost. Based on the scenario previously described, we are expecting a net shortfall for this fiscal year in the 60 to $70 million range. This could be positively or negatively impacted by many decisions that are made as we move through this year, how and when our sports compete, 
or how our operations continue to be impacted by the pandemic. We will closely monitor and evaluate this budget with the help of the budget office as the year progresses and we will have to make further operating decisions as we go. Next slide, please. This slide lists a few of the actions that have been taken to reduce expenses. In addition to the personnel cost reduction plan that is presented for your approval today, the hiring freeze, pay reductions, and furloughs already implemented are expected to reduce salary and benefits costs by a little over $3.2 million. Our current environment has challenged us to find ways to positively impact our bottom line in addition to budget reductions. Our staff has risen to this challenge with revenue generating initiatives that continue to keep Gopher fans engaged while also providing a sense of positivity and normalcy during this very difficult time. They have created virtual recruiting experiences to take the place of on-campus visits, created new and innovative sponsorship opportunities without the traditional athletic events, and produced video features that showcase the achievements of Gopher student athletes. We can also now offer our typical facility rental clients virtual alternatives to large on-campus events. While it will be difficult to quantify the financial impact of all of these efforts, it does demonstrate how our staff has identified innovative ways to contribute in these extremely unusual circumstances. Next slide, please. Here, uh, you will see the NCA financial report. And please note that this is from FY19, because given the, the, the disruption in FY20, we don't have those numbers. So this is the FY19 NCA financial report. We shared these numbers with you previously uh, in a previous presentation. And as you can see, <clears throat> of our 25 programs, we have three programs that have a net positive football, men's basketball, and men's hockey. It's important to understand when we talk about our Big Ten and NCAA distribution, that is tied to media, where football generates between 80 to 85% of that revenue, and men's basketball, the remaining 15 to 20%. There's also sponsorship numbers tied up in that revenue, which impacts football, men's basketball, and men's hockey only. The other revenue that you see is reflects revenue from gifts that are in their enhancement accounts that are marked in the NCA report and filed that way. Next slide, please. As I discussed with you previously, our operating budget ranks eighth in the Big Ten, yet we support 25 sport programs, which is the fourth highest in the conference. As all you know, we are continuously evaluating our program for Title IX compliance. During the past few years, this has included a review and guidance from a nationally recognized outside Title IX expert. The number of female students as a percentage of the university's undergraduate enrollment population has increased in recent years. As a result, we need to take steps to ensure ongoing gender equity in our program. As we announced yesterday, we are seeking board approval to no longer sponsor men's gymnastics, men's tennis, men's indoor and outdoor track and field at the end of their competition seasons this year. It's important to note that we will honor the 18.4 scholarships of all impacted students until they earn their undergraduate degree from Minnesota. Next slide. Of those 58 students, 19 are scheduled to graduate this spring or summer. And again, the 58 impacted students will continue to have access to academic advising, athletic medicine, and mental health resources. Additionally, impacted students who wish to transfer <clears throat> will receive our full support. And as I mentioned previously, the elimination of four sports ensures our continued compliance with Title IX, 
with our participation numbers mirroring the campus population, 54% female, 40% male. Change in sports sponsorship will save the department approximately $2 million in FY22. So again, if we are allowed to compete this year, given the pandemic, the savings will not be realized until FY22. And that will increase to 2.7 million annually starting in FY25 after we honor the scholarships of those student athletes. If approved, Minnesota will now offer 21 programs, which ranks eighth in the Big 10. And as each of you know, there's 14 member institutions in the conference. Next slide, please. This slide outlines the impact to the athletic staff of the personnel cost reduction plan that we are submitting for approval today. The plan was developed in close cooperation with interim vice president Horseman and his staff in the office of human resources and general counsel Doug Peterson and members of his team in the office of general counsel. With their assistance, we believe we have developed a plan that is in line with the goals of our campus leadership to limit as much as feasible the number of job losses and also in line with the strategic plan of the athletic department, United Are We. As a result of the reductions in staff in this plan, all of our employees will be asked to talent share and work together so that our department can continue to support our student athletes and create the type of experience for them that we can be proud of. Next slide, please. In summary, the long-term financial sustainability of the athletic department has been an issue that has been at the forefront since Director Coyle returned to the University of Minnesota a little over four years ago. When we discovered that the Athletes Village original financing plan that was to have been supported by multi-year increases scholarship seating donations was not going to materialize, we had to lean heavily on fundraising efforts and use increases in conference distribution to fill that gap. We have shared in pre previous presentations that we have left vacant a number of senior level positions like John Cunningham when he recently left for Cincinnati with the goal of reducing administrative costs. We have been making progress the addition of this financial setback has created a multi-year problem that will require a multi-year solution. Our ultimate goal is to lower current year expenditures as much as possible while serving the student athletes at the levels they deserve in order to reduce the shortfall at the end of the year while at the same time plan for permanent reductions to our expenditure base going forward to create some planned operating margin in our budget to pay back whatever loan is necessary at the end of this fiscal year. Thank you. And now Chair Powell, we can open it up to questions. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I believe you're muted, but uh, Regent Beeson has his hand up trying to unmute and all right before we do that I wanted to can you hear me now mm -hmm. yeah before we do that I wanted to see if uh, President Gable uh, wants to um, uh, comment at all before we uh, open it up um, thank you chair Powell um, just uh, refer back to my introductory remarks that um, this has been an incredibly deeply analyzed process taken extremely seriously and with full appreciation for the um, difficult impact it has on the lives of a lot of people, including our student athletes, um, and that we presented to you uh, in that context and for your consideration. All right, thank you, President Gable. So what I'd like to do is I would like to take the, the motions in order and discuss them in order. Um, and the first, the, the one we wanna look at first, uh, which is the review in action is the resolution related to personnel cost savings. So um, uh, 
I, I'd like to do it in that order. And, and if I could have a motion uh, on the resolution related to Twin Cities athletic personnel cost savings. I'll move that, Chair Powell. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, thank you. Moved and seconded. So now we will take uh, questions and comments on uh, uh, that resolution. And I see uh, uh, Regent Beeson with his hand up. So Regent Beeson, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna make some comments that will um, um, address probably both resolutions, although they're separate, they are related. Um, I wanna thank the, um, I wanna thank the athletic staff for the, um, for the work that's gone into this. Um, it is a really somber day. Um, you know, great universities and big universities like ours are supposed to have a lot of sports. I mean, it's part of the, it's, it, we do agriculture to medicine, everything in between. And we're accustomed to um, having all the sports. And um, so it's a, it's um, a shock to see us drop sports. And these are legacy sports. I met Roy Griak when he was alive and he would call this a treacherous move probably with the work that he put in and the program that he's built and Jerry Noyce and the tennis program, the work that these people have done is really unbelievable. And um, I'm gonna support the resolutions, but I do have to say we invited this day when we went into this model, this media and sponsorship model driven by the league, we created today and we're gonna create some more tomorrows. We were dependent on, we, were, we moved into a highly leveraged situation and I thought it would happen first when the TV contracts would go down, but uh, instead it's happened because of COVID and because we're in this sort of arms war that is uh, continuing. Um, but we, we created a sponsorship model for sports and let's just be really honest about it. This is what we're moving this is what we're in and this is, you can't be casual about it. And hope is not a strategy. We can't expect the parents and the coaches to annually fundraise for these other sports. So, I mean, it, this, is, this is the diet that we've cast. And I think staff's done a great job in sort of outlining the realities, the numbers we talked yesterday about the, the analytics and the data, they tell a story. This is where we're at. I just want to say finally, um, I'm sorry to the athletes uh, as we go move forward, but I'm mostly sad about the coaches because our Olympic coaches have done an unbelievable, they're great mentors. They don't get paid a lot of money and they work their tails off for the university and they have done so much good over the years, all of them, uh, and to see them now, you know, the, the responsibility they feel to their, their athletes and to their alumni. It's not your fault. This is sort of way beyond uh, what you could have controlled. Uh, again, I'm gonna support this resolution and the next resolution, uh, but I'm very sad. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Peason. Um, Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, yes, this, this is a very sad day. I don't think that quite captures <laughs> the seriousness um, of what we're dealing with here. But um, I do have some questions and I think we're only talking about the first resolution. Is that correct, Mr. That's Chair? correct, that's correct, Mr. Shu. <clears throat> because I, I do have some general questions. So would I say, do you want me to save those and just? Well, if there, if there, if you have questions on the first resolution, please, please raise them now. The a resolution related to the personnel cost savings. Yes, uh, well, I, I wanna congratulate um, uh, Director Coyle and Deputy Director McFarland on uh, coming coming through with uh, an estimate of 75 million that is actually held up now after further analysis. I think that's remarkable. I, I did not expect that. Um, unfortunately, it's still a big number. And one thing uh, I was wondering about is um, I think in the presentation, it was mentioned that there are assumptions for um, fall, winter, and spring, and I didn't see what those assumptions were, so I, I would like to know what those are. Um, and then uh, are these 
are these teams still practicing now? I mean, what are what are we spending right now to kind of keep things rolling? Understand, uh, I understand that, uh, you know, decisions haven't been finalized on whether or not uh, the seasons will actually proceed for this year. Um, and then uh, moving to uh, the resolution itself, um, my question is why is this up for review action this month? And uh, is there, is there a reason why um, this is actually uh, something that has to be approved right now uh, and by the board? And then um, the, the last question is, uh, is this just the first wave and what do we plan to do to fill the rest of the $75 million um, hole, which I guess would be about 72 million. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Shu. Uh, A.D. Uh, uh, Coyle, did you, uh, did you uh, track those? There are sort of three questions. One, fall, winter, spring sports, and you know what's happening now. And the second one is why review action. And then the last one is has to do with you know, or is there more to come? Is this the first? How are we going to? What, what are the other solutions? You can take those in any between you and Rhonda any way you want. Thank you, Chair Powell and, and Regent Shu. Thank you for the question. And, and I will uh, I'll take a stab and ask Ron to Rhonda to. Uh, fill in on some of the specific budget questions. But uh, uh, first off, Regent Shu, I appreciate your comments about the uh, $75 million estimate. Uh, I have said this before, I think we have the best CFO in college athletics here in Minnesota. And I'm incredibly grateful for Rhonda and the work that she does. And I've uh, been blessed to work with her at Boise State and at Syracuse and now at Minnesota. So all credit goes to Rhonda. Uh, <laughs> with respect to um, the fall, winter and spring sports, I'm going to combine uh, two of your comments, sir. Uh, per NCA rules, uh, teams are allowed to have eight hours of work when they're out of season. And when they're in season, they can have 20 hours of practice. And so right now, our teams are uh, in that eight hour when they return back to campus and, and back to school. They're in that eight hour period. And then when teams are able to start to compete, when we're given clearance from the medical experts, uh, then they will go, if they're in season, they'll go to the 20-hour week uh, limitation. Uh, with respect to the schedules for our uh, fall sports, as you obviously knew, when the Big Ten postponed the fall sports, that impacted football, uh, volleyball, soccer, and our cross-country programs. In addition to that postponement, the NCAA has moved all fall championships to the spring. So, uh, those sports uh, will be looking towards the spring for their championship season. With respect to our teams, uh, such as the hockeys, uh, the swimming and diving, uh, the basketballs, et cetera, that start their practice, uh, we are continuing to move forward with practicing as we continue to follow our medical protocol uh, that we have had in place since early July when our student athletes started to return back to campus. Um, and the um, next part of your question with respect to review and action on the personnel plan. Um, obviously, uh, as I noted, as President Gable noted and others, um, uh, we uh, implemented our, our hoping to get approval for this uh, cost reduction plan. And when we started in October, uh, that will allow us, again, if approved to capture about $1.3 million this fiscal year. And so uh, once that is approved, if approved, we can start to um, implement that program now, the appointment reduction program now, uh, and that's a benefit with that side of it. And then with respect to uh, how do we pay or how do we handle the net loss, uh, we uh, have had conversations with campus and we'll continue to have those conversations about campus with respect to a loan. Uh, I believe it was uh, Chair Powell, Regent Beeson, who talked about a, a bridge loan at the May board meeting, and we would continue to have those conversations fully aware that we would have to pay that back. Rhonda, did I miss anything? No, just to expand a little bit on the, the assumptions for the fall, winter, and spring sports. We are not building any revenue in for fall sports because of the uncertainty and significantly reduced about 15% of what we would normally do for winter and spring sports uh, with similar uncertainties. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those answers. I'm going to keep us moving because we've got other hands up here. Regent McMillan. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell. And speaking to the uh, requested review action on the personnel 
production changes, um, those certainly are painful, but, uh, and I don't have a close enough view to know, you know, just how painful, but there's people involved and, and, uh, I, I guess I have a question as to the $40,000 floor. Is that designed to track with the, with the, uh, the faculty approved resolution earlier, or what, what about that number should I understand? And then I have a, a further comment, Chair Powell. So a uh, question on the 40,000 floor, uh, maybe uh, Deputy Director McFarland takes that. Thank you, Chair Powell. The campus Y plan had a floor of 60,000. 60, okay. And ours has a floor of 40. Okay. Yet another comment, Regent McMillan. Well, I'll just take it that's your determination on the right number, and I won't second guess it. I just I, I was forgetting that the campus-wide plan was sixty. So, thank you. I uh, I we have as a board been been I think very at and and, and steady in our request to to the athletic director that. Uh, that finances, you know, be be followed and be transparent, and we track whatever might be coming to the department. And um, you know, so I, I guess we we need to. While we none of us like to see cuts like this or or drastic measures, we have to remember that as a board, we've we've been pretty insistent that we we get to a point where we are in the black and. Uh, to that end, I guess what I want to say is that I appreciate you coming forward with difficult, painful, and uh, and challenging moves like this, but we're never going to get to that point if we don't authorize you to go ahead and take the measures that you're recommending to us after considerable thought and planning. So I'm going to support this review and action request on this one. Um, I don't do so lightly, but I do so mindful of the fact that uh, as a board, we pushed pretty hard to get to the uh, the bottom of what the uh, athletic department finances are, what the fiscal situation is since uh, Mark arrived. And uh, I appreciate them even in the midst of a crisis like this, delivering and, and staying true to that request of ours. So I will support. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Uh, Regent Anderson. Okay, I took a second to unmute. Um, you know, I will support the resolutions um, and actions. I will tell you that that there's no joy in this, but it, it's also a stark reality of, of, of what has hit home. Um, you know, just yesterday, I, I, I talked to a friend, and I'm up in Alexandria where COVID-19 maybe hasn't hit like it has in the Twin Cities, and we don't realize it, but... I talked to a friend yesterday who had lost their job and what I would call to a, a COVID-19 budget issue. And it really, really hit home to me that there's a, there's a humanity here that it, it's so unfortunate. Um, you know, uh, uh, approximately four years ago, President Kaler put myself and Regent Lucas on the committee to find us a new athletic director. And uh, Director Coyle can tell you this, probably from the day he was hired when we found him, I've talked to him about improving athletics with grade points, with getting in the black and everything. And, and what is so difficult and so difficult to, to take is that we were moving forward with such great, uh, such, such great movement, all, all shots were being fired and hitting and then this COVID-19 came, and um, I, I was a guy who, who was never good in sports, but I grew up in Minnesota, and my dad loved sports. And when I was in junior high or even elementary school, I would get the Minneapolis Star Tribune early in the morning just so I could see how our gopher athletes did. And, and names like Steve Placentia in track and the Roethlisberger's in, in – and gymnastics and, you know, Dick Siebert coaching baseball. I followed that forever. Um, but, but I think it's important also that in this issue, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's an intersection of two issues that are, are coming together. 
One is our financial implications right now, but the second is our um, compliance with Title IX. As the University of Minnesota has grown in female students, we now find that we have to provide a higher percentage of opportunities for female students. And, and I guess my one question, if we did not close these men's sports, the alternate is not doing nothing. The alternate is finding the money to add more women's opportunities to them. Is that, is that not the case? And I guess with that, I, I can, I can I'll get an answer and I, I can sign off, but it, it's truly a sad day for, for many of us who have followed Gopher Athletics for our entire lives. So with that, I'll, I'll take an answer from Athletic Director Coyle on that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, thanks, Regent Anderson, for your comment. And, and uh, uh, A.D. Coyle, um, the question was on uh, uh, Title IX considerations and, you know, is there the, another, a different kind of option? Yeah, uh, Chair Powell and, and Chair Anderson, thank you for the question and for the comments. And, and uh, you're exactly right, sir. Um, as you noted, the campus, undergraduate campus population has uh, changed over the past few years. And, and now we're at approximately 54% female, 40% male. And so uh, by making this difficult decision with respect to the sports, uh, we would mirror the campus population, which would keep us in compliance with Title IX. So you could add a women's sport, uh, but obviously if you do that, that is millions of dollars um, for the startup of the sport, for the scholarships, for the coaching staff, athletic medicine, strength and conditioning, et cetera. And as I shared with you before, we are having record fundraising. You heard John and Nancy Lindahl and, and Kathy Shulikoff were talk about the record fundraising. We are having record fundraising. And as Rhonda discussed, um, when Athletes Village was, uh, was uh, approved, part of that plan was to take scholarship seating revenue to help offset that debt. And that has not occurred. And so it has put financial strain on our department. So to answer your question, yes, we would have to add a women's sports, continue to roster and manage, but that would have a significant financial impact. Thank, thank you. you. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I want to make sure that uh, Regent Swiggum gets an opportunity to be recognized. Okay, well, we'll go to Regent Swiggum right now. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, if there was somebody before me, that's just fine. But uh, um, I reflect kind of like the way Regent Anderson does. Uh, nine months ago, folks, nine months ago, we were sitting here talking about the great classroom success of our student athletes, about the success of all our athletic programs, of, of, of the best in the country, uh, hiring a great coaching staff, and winning the Outback Bowl. That was just a short nine months ago. And now uh, we're making these very painful decisions to which uh, Athletic Director Coyle, uh, I support you totally and support your dis tough decisions and the leadership that you're bringing forward. Uh, I know it's extremely tough for your staff, uh, for your coaches, for the student athletes, for the fans, but this is not a day an athletic director wants, wants to have uh, to do. It's, it's, it's your worst day possible. And uh, I, I sympathize with you and, and support your recommendations. Uh, uh, colleagues, as we look at the two resolutions, um, it's, it, I, I think it's very simple. One, we, we have to take steps, as has been said, to, uh, to make the ongoing Title IX gender, gender equity uh, uh, needs. We, we have to do that by law, by, uh, uh, it's, it's without question, we have to address that. Uh, two, you are short tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions. And, and even if the Big Ten does something with fall sports, you know, in the next month or two or three or four months, we're still gonna be tens of millions short, I'm gonna guess. And, and three, we all know we can't take money from uh, O and M budget from the general fund budget of the university that are for the mission of academic, uh, uh, our academic mission or our research mission. We, we can't do that. So I think it comes to the bottom line that uh, the leadership of Director Coyle and these extremely difficult, tough, painful decisions 
might be our only options. And, and uh, just, I guess I'm speaking to both resolutions. Um, I, I, I don't think we have choices and all choices have consequences. We realize that in life, but these are probably our best choices out of all being terrible. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, uh, Regent Swiggum. Um, Regent Simonson. Thank you, uh, Chair Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, thank you, presenters, and, and thank you, Director Coyle. I realize how tough this is, and I know you, along with I think all the regents and others, uh, President Gable, we've received a lot of emails from parents, from students, from other people in the community concerning all of this stuff, especially the uh, dropping of the four men's sports. Uh, I'm basically okay with the. Uh, cost reductions uh, as you've laid them out, although they're, as has already been said, they're relatively small. <clears throat> when you look at a $75 million estimated loss, I'm wondering if we can get a more of a breakout by sport. Uh, you know, other, uh, uh, in, in, you know, in other sources of revenue. Um, we just had a conversation on the, on the UMF, uh, $3.9 billion. And we just prior to that, how UMS is going to work with the uh, Fairview and uh, University in the Medical Center uh, on raising funds, uh, looking at other sources. Uh, you know, uh, some of these emails that we've gotten, I think, could be sources of funding. So <clears throat> I'm just, uh, I'm okay with the cost reduction right now, although it's relatively minor. I'm not okay with the, uh, the, uh, um, dropping of these sports right now. Um, I'd like to see again a breakout, like fixed costs. What's it cost to keep a tennis court going? Other ways to look at, at that. So that's just my comment. Um, other sources of revenue to me is always important to look at. Thank you, uh, Regent Simonson. Uh, AD Coyle, I think there's a, you know, the request is around you know, how costs are, are, are allocated, uh, uh, you know, in detail across the various sports. I don't know that, you know, we can go into that in detail now, but I mean, that is, a, that is the request and I'm guessing that information would be available. Yeah, Chair Pollan and Regent Simonson, thank you for the question. I, I will defer to Rhonda, but that is information that we can provide you, of course. And Rhonda, do you have anything to add on? That's something we could provide. All right, thank you. Um, Regent Rocha. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a kind of procedural question. Um, I, my comments are on the resolution or the, uh, the, the matter that's in, for consideration today, not on the resolution that's in front of us. Do you wanna take action on the resolution, the comments and, and action on that, and then come back to the other, or are we just kind of- That was, that, uh, thank you, Regent Rocha. That was the intent that we would, uh, you know, since they, there are two separate resolutions, the first one is, is review and act. So I wanted to do that one first, recognizing that, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of there's stuff in the stew, but I, I, they are separate. So I wanted to do that one first, and then we turn to the next resolution, which is a, 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 a review. I, I will wait till then. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan, I thought, I think you had your hand up. I did, but I'll await the next item. Okay. Uh, Mr. Steves, do we see, do you, I don't see any other uh, uh, regents who would like to comment uh, anything from your end? No, Mr. Chair. All right, then with that being the case, um, on the on the, the the resolution related to campus athletic personnel cost savings, uh, I will now ask uh, Mr. Steves to take the roll call. On the resolution related to athletic personnel cost savings, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. <laughs> Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. No. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. 
Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 11 in favor of the resolution and one opposed. Thank you, Mr. Steve. So that resolution carries um, and is approved. So now we'll turn uh, formally to a discussion of the second resolution. Uh, and again, this, this resolution is, uh, is considered uh, uh, as a, uh, a review item today. And this is the resolution related to the reduction in the number of uh, the uh, uh, elimination of select Twin Cities campus athletic sports programs. And so um, what I would like to do, I know that there have already been some comments and they are to a certain extent intermingled, but now we'll take them in this order. And I will, uh, uh, I see that Regent McMillan has his hand up uh, and to uh, comment and with questions. So Regent McMillan, over to you. Thank you, Chair Powell. And uh, my, uh, my input here is this, there's lots of feedback coming in as we would expect with the decision of this consequence and magnitude. And much of it focuses on what about philanthropy? Isn't there a simple philanthropic answer? We can go raise money. And, and I just think people need to appreciate that it's not going out and raising the $3 million that you'd save annually. It's one, raising enough to build a corpus that could spin out a minimum of $3 million a year. It's two, raising additional money to build that, that, that corpus of money that would also support the added costs of another woman's sport. And we tend to forget that we have something in the neighborhood of a $7 million a year annual. I don't like the word subsidy, but there's money coming into the athletic budget, much of it philanthropic in nature already, to support, you know, exactly what Mark and Rhonda are trying to get to the bottom of here, which is a black, you know, a, an in the black outcome as opposed to an in the red outcome year over year. So the size of that endowed fund that would have to exist in order to put out the annual operating support for these four sports, plus a women's sport, plus ultimately get to the bottom of how we might eliminate that ongoing subsidy is is really, really a big, big number. Quickly getting you into the deep eight digits and probably close to nine and into the ninth digit without uh, you know too much of a stretch of the imagination. I'm sure it's over 60 million alone to support the four sports and it goes up from there to do the other things. So I, 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 I sound harsh as I say that, but I think the realism is not going out and finding a donor that that could write a check for a couple that might save one of these programs for a couple of years. We have to have a plan that would provide that kind of income year over year over the long haul, or we're doing everybody a disservice here to kind of limp along in a year by year mode. So that's just uh, how I'm viewing that and the realities of, uh, of, uh, of philanthropy and fundraising and the economics of, uh, of endowments and annual uh, spinouts of uh, what, what an endowed fund can produce. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent McMillan for that comment. Um, Regent Rocha. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, actually uh, Regent McMillan went into the, the, the topical area that I wanted to talk about with, um, with our early um, finish time yesterday uh, in our committee meetings, I was able to make it home and, and take my nine-year-old son to his, his uh, football practice. And we were driving along and I was, we were talking about our days and I was talking about this information that had just come out about this. And he was asking, um, and I told him that we were uh, discussing about whether these four sports, you know, the four sports that were uh, to be discontinued. And, and he asked me you know, why and seemed a bit alarmed. Um, and, uh, and I explained to him the, the realities of the circumstance and COVID and the budget challenges that, that the department is facing. And, and he was quiet for a second. Then he said, um, you know, that kills a lot of dreams. And um, it, it, that hit me pretty hard. And, you know, I, I thought about that. I thought about the difficulty of, of serving in, in positions like ours, where you're considering the impacts on so many people. I mean, every year, 
um, when we have the when we welcome the, the, the new students, I, it, 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 it strikes me about the thousands of Minnesota students that had maybe spent years um, hoping to be gophers, but were not admitted. And so we, we do run into these kinds of very difficult circumstances where these decisions have to be made. And I appreciate the fact that, that, that our colleagues are you know, all very much sensitive to the fact that these have significant impacts on people's lives. I look at, um, you know, I look at the fact that, you know, there are some institutions, you know, there, there's, they call it the SEC model, where you maintain the minimum number of sports necessary to uh, be able to be at the D1 level in the, in the major revenue sports, the marquee sports of football and basketball and so on. And, and in those situations, these opportunities never existed. And so to some extent, the, you know, they don't go through the pain of having to deal with these sorts of issues because they never offered it in the first place. And so I think that it's been you know, fantastic that the University of Minnesota has been able to offer so many opportunities to so many people over all these years. And, and, and you also put that in the context of our student body as a whole. We have students that have been doing things their whole lives and things that contribute, whether it's people working on a solar car uh, that, will, that will develop technologies that will serve the world. Or you know, we have a, the Gopher Dairy judging team over on the St. Paul campus where I did my undergrad. All, all they do is win national championships in, in dairy judging. And and uh, they'll go on and take that skill to feed the world uh, for the rest of their lives. But, you know, they do that uh, out of love. It's not, they don't receive scholarships. There's not a, a, a major support structure for them. So, you know, there's so many complex components to these, these types of, of conversations. Um, but I, I'm, you know, very impressed with the sensitivity and, and uh, the, the resolve, uh, you know, to, to address these issues uh, that's been shown by our department, uh, Director Coyle, um, you know, I, I appreciate that this is a very challenging spot to be in, and I respect very much that you're um, uh, seeking to do this in a way that is, is uh, very respectful, very, um, very professional. And uh, finally, I would just turn back to you then with the question, and this, I want to frame Regent McMillan's um, statement as, as a bit of a question, because we're, we're definitely going to be receiving inquiries about the possibility for third parties to, to step in. Um, by means of an endowment. And, and I understand that, you know, you can show us the actual dollars and cents on th that specific program. I think there are a lot of other uh, resources and costs that, that are involved with, with, you know, every student athlete that's on campus. But if, if someone were to say, you know, were to ask the question, you know, could, could we not endow some of the non-revenue sports? Um, and again, recognizing Regent McMillan's very apt description that there's also the, the, the issue of having to add a sport if you were to um, proceed on, down the same road. Do, do we have any sense of how much would have to be generated in an endowment to be able to provide support for these types of programs? Um, uh, Regent Rocha, thank you for uh, that um, question and which, as you say, it, it echoes a, a comment that uh, Regent McMillan made. I think what I'd like to do is, is um, ask uh, A.D. Coyle to, to comment on that, if they've had a chance to think on that, and if and, and President Gable, if you want to jump in, but you know the question has to do with the feasibility of, you know, creating an endowment uh, for these uh, for these for these uh, to to support these sports. Uh, Ad Coyle, do you want to take a swing at that? Yeah, uh, Chair Powell and, and Regent Rocha, um, I appreciate your comments and uh, and uh, really appreciate the comment of your son. Uh, I cannot tell you how hard yesterday was. Talking to those impacted student athletes, I really appreciate his comments. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe add my thoughts and then ask Rhonda for her thoughts. Uh, but my understanding is, for every million dollars you raise, you spin off about forty or forty-five thousand dollars a year. So you're talking significant, significant amounts of money, millions upon millions of dollars that would have to be raised immediately. Uh, so we could use that interest to support those programs. And as I shared with you, and as Rhonda discussed in her talking points, uh, when we arrived here four years ago, you know, we had these parallel tracks with respect to the financial reality of what we're dealing with, uh, and then also the Title IX component of it. And obviously, um, as we review our programs from a Title IX perspective, uh, these are difficult choices we have to make to remain in compliance with that. Yes, you could add a women's sports program, but again, you're talking about millions upon millions of dollars to start that program. Uh, so I assure you, Regent Rocha, and as you know, and as President Gable noted, we gave great, great thought uh, to these difficult decisions. And we analyzed every possible way 
because I promise you, um, uh, the number of texts I got from ADs across the country last night, uh, no AD wants to do this. There's not one who wants to do this. And I feel like we've exhausted every possible avenue. And these are the difficult decisions we have to make. Rhonda, do you have anything to add? Chair Powell and Regent Rocha, uh, Chair McMillan did a good job of making the estimation of what it might take for these four sports. A $60 million number is the number that we were working from as well. And we did not consider what it would cost for an additional women's sport because that's not something we had considered as part of our proposal. Okay, thank you for those. Uh, thank you for those comments, uh, A.D. Coyle um, and Director McFarland. All right, um, Regent uh, Regent Rocha, thank you for those comments. I'm going to turn and question. I'm going to turn now to Regent Kenyana. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, and appreciate this conversation and the presentation. And certainly appreciate the tough decisions. I I have a couple of questions and comments, um, and. The first is that um, in reading the news, um, I it was framed, or maybe just I interpreted as a as a as a result and a reaction to uh, the COVID and the seventy five you know million dollar hole. But as I'm hearing this conversation, um, I, I'm I'm getting a sense that maybe that was the tipping point, but that this may have been necessary or considered before. And I, I say that um, on the heels of Regent McMillan's comments about how. The philanthropy wouldn't um, would need to support year over year operations, and it's sounding like the Title Nine a Title Nine correction was overdue anyway. Um, so I would just need clarification on um, absent COVID, were some of these changes um, still somewhat necessary or being considered? Well, thank you for that question, uh, Regent Kenyana. Uh, Ad Coyle, um, good question. Can you uh, will you give us your thoughts? Yeah, Chair Powell and, and Regent Kenyanya, thank you for the question. Uh, we have been evaluating our sports, sports programs for a few years with respect to Title IX. And uh, without question, COVID has sped up this conversation, uh, but we were having these conversations that we needed to look at our sport offerings. Uh, as I shared with you before, uh, the eighth largest budget in the Big Ten, yet we offer the fourth highest number of sports. Um, that imbalance it had created strain financially, obviously, but then from a Title IX perspective, with the undergraduate population changing the past few years, um, we have been working incredibly hard, and our coaches deserve a lot of credit. Uh, Julie Manning, our senior women's administrator, deserves a lot of credit because we've been managing our rosters as much as possible, uh, trying to stay within uh, the parameters of Title IX, which we've been able to do. Uh, but in doing so, it cost some of our women's sports programs to have rosters that were bigger than the national average. And so when we talk about these difficult decisions that we made yesterday and are seeking board approval on, we're gonna to have to continue to manage our rosters on the women's side as well. And I think it's important to note, you know, when we talk about these four programs, uh, adding just one women's sports would not solve the issue. We would have to add more than one women's teams to keep the numbers in balance, given the difference. So. Again, um, we were still having these conversations and Tile 9 is an impact on it, yes. Regent Kenyana, does that, uh, does, that, does that get to it? It does get to that one. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, A.D. Coyle. Um, and next, I had a question about the, the numbers and this is maybe just my lack of understanding. Um, 58 impacted students, but I was looking at the memo we had the other day and just adding up the the numbers of uh, participants in those sports and the, the number tends to be a little higher. And um, is that is that because of crossover uh, students who participate in, in multiple sports? Um, or or was I just doing my math incorrectly? Uh, I'm looking at the memo from a few days ago and just adding up the number of athletes in those identified sports. It doesn't seem to be 58. A.D. Coyle. Uh, Chair Powell and Regent Kenyanya. So um, how you count the student athletes uh, indoor and outdoor track, uh, they would be counted twice as, as participant opportunity. So it is 58 student athletes who will be impacted uh, by this decision to, uh, to uh, not sponsor these sports after the completion of this year. Okay. Uh, so you were, I think, doing some double counting, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, my math teachers wouldn't be surprised. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> last year, 
I, well, I guess the clarification is, from the first question um, that, you know, this was an ongoing evaluation is helpful because to my colleagues' earlier points, it is easy to look at the 75 and say, well, 2.7 doesn't really do much for you. I mean, it, you know, it helps, but, um, and, and maybe start to reach for that uh, philanthropic solution. But if, if this was already um, in the works and, and the clarification that two women's sports would be needed um, to offset this um, is helpful. My, my last question, um, to, to whatever extent possible, A.D. Coyle, um, I, I guess, how do you, why these sports? I guess I know that's a difficult, you know, question, um, but, you know, how do you, how did you identify which ones? I know some of it is just numbers, um, but if you could speak to that, and that'll be my last one, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Regent Kenyanya. A.D. Coyle. Uh, Chair Powell and Regent Kenyanya. Uh, you know, I, I would argue, and all of you have seen this up close, that we've been one of the most resourceful athletic programs in the country. Um, we have had, I think if my numbers are correct, since 2000, we've won 76 Big Ten championships in 20 different sports. Uh, we have maximized our resources as much as we can. In Regent Kenyana, there's not one answer to why these four sports. Uh, I can tell you that we looked and we did a deep, deep analysis with, um, with the Office of General Counsel and with others, and when we look at the trends nationally, how many of these sports compete nationally, we looked at the local and national impact and the interest of these sports, uh, and then we also looked across the Big Ten and the NCA. So we looked at several different factors. We looked at competitive success. So not one item fits each sport. There's just many different factors that led to us looking at these sports. And again, in consultation with, uh, with our OGC and with outside counsel, uh, these sports uh, were made because it helps us get to the numbers we need to get to with respect to matching the undergraduate population. Thank you. All right. Uh, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, again, thank you, uh, Director Coyle. <clears throat> I'm going to follow along uh, where uh, Regent Kenyanya was going or had been because those were some of my questions. I was actually involved in um, uh, trying to save the men's golf team um, almost 20 years ago. I don't really remember uh, the details. It's all a little foggy now, but uh, I remember there was money raised. I don't know what happened to the money. Um, so I'll just ask this question. Do, do any sports uh, currently have um, that type of endowment that would help pay for some of the expenses, you know, because that's one thing that we, I don't think we know anything about is uh, where each uh, sport is um, overall financially in terms of where the money comes from. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Shu. So I think uh, uh, AD, AD Coyle, the question is very clear. Yeah, uh, Chair Powell and, and Regent Shu, I'm going to ask Rhonda to address that question. Chair Powell and Regent Shu. Currently, there would not be an endowment similar to what we are talking about to fund a sport. There are endowments for specific scholarships for sports. So depending on the scholar, depending on the sport, there may be different numbers of scholarships that are endowed. But in terms of an endowment for operating funds, we do not have any at this time. Thank you. Quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah, so I, I noticed, so cr men's cross country is actually um, not included in, in the uh, indoor and outdoor track. Is that correct? And then also what, um, I'm not sure, you know, if it's the same people or different people or um, are there some people that uh, are counted again in cross country? Thank you. Uh, A.D. Coyle. Uh, Chair Powell and, and Regent Shu. Uh, you, you are correct. Uh, men's cross country, we would still continue to sponsor men's cross country. We would offer five scholarships and some of our men's cross country student athletes do compete uh, in the distance in the track and field events. But we would still sponsor men's cross country with five scholarships. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think I see one more uh, uh, region to uh, uh, region Beeson would like to I have one more comment. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Rick, and then and then that'll that'll be it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, um, when Athletic Director Coyle mentioned my comment back in May about a willingness to float a loan to the athletic department, 
what we're hearing today is his uh, reaction, thinking through how do I repay this loan? And this is a bright line for the board about, uh, we expect this loan, if we make one, to be repaid. The terms may be generous, but we owe it to the institution, to the donors and the students who created the cash that we use to subsidize this unfortunate loss, this loss that is um, not the responsibility of the athletic department, but that's the end of the day, creating, expecting the athletic department to operate on a break even level is, is really a line we can't cross because there's unlimited needs around athletics. There would be no end to the subsidy that we would incur if we made this an exception that is a doing this without a loan repayment. So this amount of savings is the beginning for the repayment plan. Unfortunately, it's gone out of the high to these other sports. But I, I can't without uh, conscience support um, forgiving this loan uh, and just writing it off. It's just not fair to the rest of the university. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. I'm going to uh, call it at that now. Everyone who wants to speak has spoken. Uh, A.D. Coyle, um, you know, you and your team are in a very, find yourself uh, with us in a very tough situation, and we're asking you to, you know, to lead us through and out of that situation. And it's, I think you can, uh, it's clear that um, uh, the board understands how difficult this is. Uh, and what a tough situation uh, this is, you know, for you and your team, but of course, for our student athletes, for the coaches, especially for you and for this board. And uh, we know that, you know, this is tough. It's a very somber day. And uh, uh, we, we want to thank you and your team for, you know, pulling together these, these plans and these resolutions. We'll come back in October uh, to act on uh, this second resolution. But for now, uh, that will conclude um, uh, our discussion on the second resolution. Um, Mr. Steves, we're moving, we'll move now, I think, to the report of the committees. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, <clears throat> so we'll change gears now and move on to the committee's reports. Uh, we'll begin with the report of the Audit and Compliance Committee uh, Regent Rocha, would you please share your report? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Audit and Compliance Committee uh, did not consider any action items this month. The committee had several discussion items that in the interest of time, I will highlight briefly. First, we discussed the committee's 2020-2021 work plan, and I'll just highlight that we've added one additional meeting this year, so the committee will meet six times. The work plan is intentionally flexible in order for the committee to have time for relevant and emerging topics throughout the course of the year. We discussed the follow-up uh, recommendations from Internal Audit's External Quality Assurance Review that was conducted last fiscal year. Chief Auditor Klatt also provided the committee with an update on upcoming and ongoing internal audit activities. In the absence of a formal plan for fiscal year 2021, the committee provided input on recommended audits to be conducted in the coming year. Finally, Controller Sue Paulson presented an overview of the university's distribution of funding from the Federal CARES Act. I would be happy to discuss any of the items in greater detail with any interested member of the board. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. All right. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, Regent Beeson, please will you report on behalf of the Litigation Review Committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Litigation Review Committee did meet yesterday, and at the meeting we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to attorney-client privilege. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Regent Beeson. Uh, for the Mission Fulfillment Committee, uh, Regent Anderson, uh, would you report, please? I will. The Mission Fulfillment Committee acted on one action item this month. The committee voted to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes approval of new change and discontinued academic programs and conferral of promotion and tenure. I move approval of the consent report. Are there any uh, questions or comments on uh, the motion to approve the Mission Fulfillment Committee consent report? I don't see any questions there. So uh, seeing, seeing no uh, comments or questions, I'll ask Mr. Steves uh, to call the roll uh, on that uh, report. 
on the mission fulfillment consent report. Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and none opposed. All right, that motion is approved. Uh, Regent Anderson, was there any uh, additional committee business to report on? <clears throat> that concludes my report, sir. All right, thanks Regent Anderson. Uh, Regent McMillan, please uh, share the report of the Finance and Operations Committee. I will do so, Chair Powell. We have uh, three items that uh, for board action today that the committee acted on yesterday. Um, first of all, the committee voted unanimously to recommend adoption of the consolidation of Board of Regents policies, selection of design professionals, and wage rates for contractors. And I bring that committee recommendation forward. All right. So it comes uh, that that comes from the committee uh, moved. Uh, any additional questions or comments on uh, region policy, selection of design professionals and wage rates for contractors? I don't see, uh, I don't see anything. So uh, uh, Mr. Steves, we'll call the roll call on, on that um, uh, resolution. On the consolidation of Board of Regents policy, selection of design professionals and wage rates for contractors, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent well, Swigum votes. It may be that I'll be able to, if we finish by a quarter to. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and none opposed. All right, thank you, Mr. Steves. That motion's approved. And back to you, Regent McMillan, for your continuation of your report. Regent McMillan, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I'd gotten good at uh, not doing that, but I've got learning to do. The committee separated one item from the consent report. I will move the rest of the consent report first and then come back to that item that we accepted. The committee voted oh. unanimously to recommend approval of the remaining items in the consent report, which includes the central reserves, general contingency, purchase of goods and services, $1 million and over, a resolution related to the issuance of debt, one real estate transaction, two capital budget amendments, and one's kept schematic design. I move approval of those items in the consent report. All right, that's been moved. Uh, we discussed that those yesterday. I don't see uh, any raised hands now as we come upon <coughs> a, a, a full board vote on that. So um, I'll ask Mr. Steves uh, to call the roll. On the uh, finance consent report, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. <clears throat> yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. 
Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rocha. Regent yes. Rocha. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and none opposed. All right, so that portion of the consent report is approved. Uh, Regent McMillan, your final item, please. The final item is the committee voted to recommend approval of the employment agreement for an appointment of Myron Franz as Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations. And I bring the, uh, the committee's recommended approval of that forward for board action. All right. Are there any uh, uh, co comments on that? I see one raised hand for an additional comment on uh, the resolution to approve the appointment of Myron Franz. I see Regent Rocha would like to comment. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the comments on the merits were, I think, well made yesterday by members of the board. I, I would ask the chair, and maybe this is a question for Mr. Langworthy, would it be possible um, to uh, separate the appointment of uh, Mr. Franz to the position separate from the terms of the agreement? Uh, Mr. Langworthy, Mr. Steves is I, the... I, Mr. Chair, I actually think we may need General Counsel Peterson uh, to weigh in on that. I, um, my initial reaction is I, I don't know how that would work. We'd be appointing him to the position, but without terms of employment, so I'm not sure. I see uh, the general counsel uh, walking to the podium. Uh, Chair Powell, um, Mr. Steves, um, it, it is just a practical problem. It seems as if your first motion could be a motion to appoint a Mr. Franz contingent on the board um, agreeing to a uh, a contractual arrangement, so it would be contingent on passing the second motion, which uh, still hooks them together, but would allow for two separate votes if that's what the board wanted to do. Um, so I think that just gets back to the more discretionary question of what the board's preference is. Uh, Regent Rocha, um, does, does that help? We could, we could, uh, you could move that we separate the appointment from the contract and we can see if that gets a second and what the board wants to do, or uh, we can just uh, move forward uh, in the way that we had planned to. Well, Mr. Chair, I, um, the, in the absence of having done homework in advance to have language prepared, um, I, I, I will, unless someone else were to step forward and move such, I would, I would accept the, comments of yesterday and, and, and a comment now that, that um, I'm enthusiastic about what Mr. Franz will bring to the position and I'm optimistic that uh, he will have the impact that, um, that, that we're hoping that he has and, and I look forward to meeting and uh, working with him. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll cast my vote uh, as to the terms of the agreement as yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha uh, for, that, for that comment. Uh, I don't see anyone else with their hand up. And so unless they're, I think Mr. Steves, I'll ask you to call the roll. On the appointment and related terms of employment for Myron Franz, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. <clears throat> Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. No. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kenyanya. No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rocha. No. Regent Rocha votes no. Regent Simonson. No. Regent Simonson votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. 
Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are eight in favor and four opposed. All right, that motion carries. Uh, and th thank you. Um, we have um, one final item of business before us, uh, and that is the election of a treasurer um, of the Board of Regents for the remainder of the term ending uh, June 30th, 2021. And this item is before us for review and action today. I'd entertain the nomination of Myron Franz as treasurer for the Board of Regents, effective September 30th, 2020. Uh, and uh, so I would entertain a, a motion to approve the nomination of Myron Franz as treasurer. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, Myron Franz has been nominated as treasurer. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to elect Myron Franz as treasurer. We already have that moved and seconded. I don't see anyone with their hand raised on that appointment. So Mr. Steves, I'll call the roll on that. All right, Mr. Chair, we'll do the roll on this. And then uh, we did miss the governance and policy committee report. So we can we can circle back to that. Oh, right I beg afterwards. your pardon. Okay, we'll do this no, and then right. we'll do that. Yep. All right, so on the election of Myron Franz as treasurer of the Board of Regents, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are 12 in favor and none opposed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Steve. So uh, Myron Franz has been elected Board of Regents Treasurer effective September 30th, 2020 by a vote of 12 to zero. Regent Mayron, I apologize. Please, can we have your report? Yes, it's very, very lengthy. I should be done in about a half hour. <laughs> governance and policy. <laughs> the Governance and Policy Committee did not consider any action items this month. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you. All right. Now let's see, we're go to see if we have any old business to come before the board. Uh, if, if, you, if there's any old business, please use raise hand. So I see, I, I see two hands raised on old business. Um, are the, is that correct? Uh, Regent Shu, do you wanna uh, uh, bring some old, uh, old business? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think Regent Rosha had his hand up first, so I'll let him go first. All right, okay. Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the challenge is always understanding the definition of old business versus new business, and so here we are. Um, I, uh, I, believe, I believe the members of the board and it received from uh, <clears throat> Mr. Steve's uh, a, proposed, um, a proposed change or to the amendments to, uh, to the urgent approval authority. We've had long meetings, I won't go into it exhaustively, but the intent is just to kind of to, to, uh, elucidate the, proceed, the procedure as we now have the ability as shown through this, uh, the, the last several months to convene members of the board in special and, and emergency meetings with fairly short uh, notice that this would, that this uh, does provide a clarification of that. Uh, I certainly would be happy to answer any questions anybody would have about that information, but following our typical uh, for matters of this variety, information followed by action. I'm only presenting it to everyone at this point for information and then would uh, seek to, to uh, move with subject any changes that we would decide to make to this language, uh, move it at our next meeting. So with that, um, I believe everybody has it, Mr. Steves. Uh, Mr. Chair and Regent Rosha, that uh, the resolution that you uh, crafted has been shared with the board and uh, we, can, we can make that available on the screen as well so the, the audience can see it. And just as, a, just as clarification, uh, Regent Rocha, uh, 
uh, we, we were uh, we were expecting that and appreciate the uh, you know the advance time that you gave us. We simply had it as new business, not old business. Oh, yeah, that's again, Mr. Chair, my error for for raising my hand in the, the no wrong biggie. Uh, the wrong modifier. Yeah, just, I just wanted you to know that we 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 had it and 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 you know and want to discuss it. Thank thank you. And Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Swigum is seeking to be recognized. Okay, uh, Regent Swigum. Oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I I will wait. I see there are three ahead of me, and I don't want to jump in front of anybody. All right, let me just uh, get to my, uh, okay, there we go. So I see uh, Regent Shu. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as we've, I think, discussed and received many emails uh, about providing uh, isolation and quarantine housing for the uh, Greek system, uh, I, I think that uh, we have declined to do that. So I, I would like to move a motion to provide the 25. Mr. Chair, um, yes, we're on. Yeah, we're, we're on a different topic first, I think. Yeah, I know. So uh, Regent Shu, if I could ask you to hold off on that, we want to do these in, 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 in order. And I think the, 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 the point that we're on now is Regent Roche's uh, a proposal regarding uh, our uh, on urgent approval, and let's let's do that one first, and as we'll come back to you, uh, and Regent Beeson, I think you want to speak to the urgent <clears throat> approval. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it seems that we've got urgency around the urgent approval resolution, um, and I was wondering uh, if the author would be. I, I think this it's got some merit to it. I would prefer that it go back to the governance committee in October for discussion review and then bring it back to the board if it gets through committee in December. But uh, it, I think for the hour of the day and uh, the fact that we haven't really had a chance to talk through a normal committee, I'd ask him to withdraw that uh, motion until we um, can get it on the docket for, as I proposed. Uh, Mr. Regent, Regent Rocha, um, would that be uh, an acceptable alternative? I mean, I think it is. A, it, I think it is a, a point that certainly merits discussion. And the idea that we move it through, since it is a kind of governance policy question, I think the suggestion that we move that to the agenda of the governance committee, to me, uh, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. W would you be willing to uh, move forward in that way? Yeah, Mr. Chair, you know, I, I agree with Regent Beeson's, at least if I'm reading him right, that this isn't an urgent matter so much other, you know, as other than a, a good housekeeping or house cleaning type matter. I, I actually initially asked to put it before the Governance and Policy Committee. I was told this is this is how the, the board would, would uh, consider it. So um, obviously, if I, you know, other than the delay that occurs from another month, um, this is the, that is the proceeding that I would have preferred um to have that conversation through governance and policy so there's not a motion in front of us um so in the absence of a motion being in front of us i would if with chair powell's and and the, the chair mayron's um willingness i'll happily uh, you know seek to have that put in front of uh, uh, chair mayron's committee uh, mr steves do we need any action by the board now to uh to uh consider uh, 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 Region Roche's uh, idea in, in the governance committee, or can we just kind of take the sense of the board that that's what we'll do? Uh, Mr. Chair, you would have the authority just to place it on the agenda uh, for the governance and policy committee. So if you're uh, amenable to that, then that then no further board action is needed. I'm I'm very amenable to that. I, I would like to I would like to uh, go forward in that way. We'll put it on the governance uh, committee agenda. And uh, and and move move forward on that idea that way. Okay, I see um, Regent Shu has his hand up, and so we'll go to and Regent Kenyanya. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Regent Shu now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. I was a little bit confused as to where we're going, but what I wanted to do um, was to move a resolution to provide up to 25 rooms to the Greeks for isolation and or quarantine um, due to COVID-19. And my understanding is they will pay any fees associated with that. 
Okay, um, it's been moved that we uh, uh, identify uh, and hold 25 beds for Greek quarantine. It's been moved by uh, Re uh, Regent Shu. Is there a second? Uh, hearing none, um, I think that uh, that re that resolution is not going to is not going to move forward. Okay, uh, I have another one. Uh, I'm going to move now to uh, Regent Kenyanya, who had his hand up. Uh, Mr. Chair, my my question was uh, Regent Beeson covered what I was going to say, so I withdraw. Okay. Uh, Regent Shu, do you have another new business item? Yes, I have a, another resolution. This is a, a resolution related to uh, Big Ten Fall 2020 sports competition. And I can just read that. Okay. Uh, whereas the University of Minnesota became a charter member of the modern day Big Ten Athletic Conference at the direction of the Board of Regents nearly 125 years ago and has a proud history of competing in the Big Ten. And whereas fall sports, namely football games between Division I colleges and universities have been played on September 3rd and September 5th, 2020, with no reported negative impacts. And where the Big 12, ACC, and SEC conferences, among others, are scheduled to compete in fall sports, including football, and where student athletes attend the university with an accept, expectation to compete and develop as athletes, as well as academically with many intending to pursue professional and national and international amateur competition. And whereas since the August 11th, 2020 postponement of the fall 2020 seasons for all sports, strides have been made in detecting COVID-19 including the FDA approved Abbott $5 Binax now antigen COVID-19 test, which produces tests in 15 minutes. And whereas fall 2020 competition between Big Ten peers of vital, is of vital interest to the University of Minnesota and its student athletes. And whereas safe and managed Big Ten competition this fall will have significant benefits for the university's student athletes the university community and the people of Minnesota and will have a significant impact on the athletics department due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Regents ad adopts the following resolution. The University of Minnesota supports proceeding with Big Ten fall sports, including football, commencing at the earliest logistically possible date for each sport with appropriate safeguards and monitoring. Uh, that's a very, very lengthy uh, a resolution uh, with uh, quite a bit of complexity uh, and none of it written down. Um, so I think it's going to be a tough one to follow. Uh, you know, having having said that, um, is is there a second to the resolution? And could you just restate the um, the the summary um, decision that the resolution asks for? Sure. I, I can also send it, but um, hang on one second. So the the very it, the the end is the very simple uh, part of it, and it is it merely says the University of Minnesota supports proceeding with Big Ten fall sports, including football, commencing at the earliest logistically possible date for each sport, with appropriate safeguards and monitoring. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, I'll open this up for discussion. Um, are there any comments on uh, this resolution? Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Paula. I'm a little confused on uh, what the timing of this. Does that mean next week or does that mean September 21? 
Thanks. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 Regent Shu, uh, what, what's the what's the timing? I can answer that. So it basically, since the Big Ten has not, uh, the Presidents and Chancellor Committee has not met again to consider uh, whether or not small fall sports would be um, rescheduled or or scheduled. Um, this just plainly leaves leaves it as uh, the position of, uh, of the Board of Regents and the University of Minnesota that we would like to play as soon as it's possible. Okay, are there any, uh, um, Regent Mayron? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I believe I'm unmuted here, all right. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm, I, I will say I'm, a, I'm taken aback by this motion coming at this late hour. Uh, not, uh, I'm not commenting on the, and when I say taken aback, what I'm taken aback with is the process by which it is coming before us. Uh, and in terms of what I think constitutes good governance, um, obviously this is something that uh, Rishu cares about. He's taken the time to draft uh, what is a, a lengthy statement that precedes his actual resolution for which none of us have had an opportunity to review it, consider it much less to get the input from the administration, whether that be President Gable, Athletic Director Coyle, uh, and other important constituents before we act on it. So for me, I will be voting against the resolution because I don't think it has had the proper advance notice and consultation uh, that forms what I think creates good government. So on that basis, I'm going to vote against this resolution. Uh, thank you, Regent Mayron. Uh, Regent Beeson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would oppose, this is really, frankly, very poor attempt at governance. And uh, this is a, an administrative matter, and I would ask you to vote no. Thank you, uh, Regent Beeson. Regent Roshan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could ask a couple questions of Regent Chu. Um, I guess what I'm, what I'm reading this is, is that there's been a lot of confusion, I think, um, nationally, frankly. I mean, this is, you know, is a very high, um, publicity, very, uh, there's a great deal of public consciousness about this issue, about how um, how our conference is going to compete, uh, where, uh, you know, other, other conferences are competing. And, and I know there's been some dialogue about how, and I, I think you've been a part of a lot of it, about how the board uh, factors into that governance question. And I guess this would go a bit to Regent Mayron's concerns. Um, let me know if I'm getting this right. Is it is this a, a function of, of your desire for the board to be part of this conversation when I don't think the board has been or certainly hasn't been provided much information about what's going on, but that from, from your position, the board would be taking a position on behalf of the University of Minnesota that as a member of our conference, we would like to see as the other conferences that are proceeding, um, that our conference would proceed with with sports this fall yet. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yes. Mr. Chair, so, you know, that, that uh, the challenge I think we have is this is happening in, in real time. All of this stuff is happening in real time. And I think, you know, I think that certainly I take from Regent Shu's effort um, and language um, a, a frustration that the board has not been, you know, informed and part of this conversation about a matter that we just spent the better part of the morning talking about, you know, potentially nine figures in, in losses for uh, athletic departments and the idea that the board has not been a part of that. Um, I, I guess I can, I would share his frustration in that regard. And so to the extent that from what I heard in his language, um, that there is a, a, a requirement for appropriate safeguards and a, a, a recognition <clears throat> of logistical um, necessity to be capable, which I wouldn't imagine would be within a week, but it might be with, within three weeks that the Big Ten would be joining the other major conferences that are going to perform, are going to compete 
which obviously would have a huge um, impact on the athletic department's ability to continue to operate. Um, and, and obviously we have a lot of student athletes, including a number that are part of sports that, that within a month may no longer be um, on, our, on our roster. Um, it would give them an opportunity to compete in, 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 uh, in their sports as well, provided it's logistically possible and with appropriate safeguards and oversight. So um, it's fairly short notice, but I'm inclined to support the resolution. Thank you. Okay, Regent Anderson. Uh, Regent Anderson, you're muted. Okay. There I am. There I am. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I see Regent Shoe's point. I mean, I really do. I think, I think there's a lot of people out there that want to see sports start as fast as possible. My concern with this is that I think there are other things than just saying we want it to start. I think there are health of fans, there are health of students, there are health of athletes. There's all kinds of things. There may even be ramifications with, you know, contractual agreements with television or whatever. My biggest concern about this is that I believe this board will vote this down, and I, I think that's I will vote negative on it. I think that might actually send a message when it hits the paper, University of Minnesota regions vote not to have football. And so I would prefer that this just be withdrawn. Uh, thank you, Regent Anderson. Uh, Regent Shu. And then we're, and then we're going to, that's it. That's the last hand up. Then we'll vote on this. Uh, am, am I just responding to? Oh, I, you're, I, I saw your hand up. So it looks like so you. I can respond. Mr. Chair, I can respond to that. That uh, okay, quickly, please. As all of you know, I have I have been uh, on email uh, trying to get a resolution or trying to get some indication of how the board wants to move forward with this. Um, nobody responded, or very few people responded. I think this is an appropriate, timely uh, resolution based on the discussion that we just had, and I believe that. Uh, there are people, uh, uh, there are lots of conferences playing, uh, playing football and hopefully uh, and other sports. I'm not aware that other sports have started yet, but we should be in no different uh, situation um, in terms of our league or our conference. And um, basically, I, I think the, the Big Ten is, it, it's, a, it's become a joke every day in the media. And I just uh, feel that the University of Minnesota needs to be on record as to what direction we think we're gonna be in. If you wanna vote no, vote no. That's, you know, that's All right. basic. All right, thank you, Regent Shu. So- Mr. Chair, uh, yeah. Regent, Regent Swigum is seeking to be recognized. Of, uh, yes, Regent Swigum and then Regent Kenyanya. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, first of all, I can't follow the resolution. I would love to have the resolution in front of me somehow by email or something so I could follow it. Uh, but secondly, there's an old, uh, there's an old saying that goes, uh, something like, it goes beyond my pay grade. Um, I think this resolution in fact goes beyond my pay grade. I'm not the athletic director. I'm not the president. I'm not Kevin Warren, the head of the big 10. Uh, and I agree with Mr. Anderson that a the negative vote on this sends a wrong message that we don't want to send. And we got to put some faith in those people that we uh, that we hire, that we give the jurisdiction to, that we give responsibility to. And would I like to play football? Yes, but there are so many other concerns that have to be involved in this decision. It goes beyond my pay grade. Mr. Chair, can I respond? Uh, in, a, in a moment, uh, Regent Kenyana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very briefly, I guess I'm also one of those who won't be supporting because of, I guess, lack of clarity um, and, and just wanting to know more. And, and to Regent Anderson points, unfortunately, that may send the wrong message. Uh, I guess what I will say, I, I don't take it. I fully understand why we, we have to have the president be the delegate 
um, at the Big Ten. Um, but I will say um, that in the aftermath, I think it would be helpful for us when considering this today and in the future, just having more information. Um, you know, when we look at the academic side, we had the same conversation about, you know, are we going to reopen and what's that plan going to be like? And we revised it many times. Um, so, you know, I, I feel comfortable speaking to that. Um, the decision was made that, you know, the Big Ten wouldn't be having sports and, and our university is one of them. And clearly there's reasons for that. And, and you know, you want to trust that. But then after that, um, you know, I would like to know what that rationale is, um, have that discussion to then be able to support that, um, especially when you see that others are participating and seemingly safely. I mean, we don't know how it's going to turn out. But um, anyway, I, I will be... Um, not supporting the resolution. And again, just on the periphery of this conversation, we know there have been conversation about um, should should the board have been making that decision? And I don't see how that would make sense with all the institutions board uh, being involved. I, I understand why we delegate that to the president, but I, I do think more information and conversation on the, on the, uh, on the aftermath of that uh, would be helpful when having a conversation like this. Okay, thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, I won't support this either. I share the concern of several other regions that it could be misinterpreted given how it's been brought up. We aren't making a decision on whether we play football or not. That decision's been made by the conference we chose to be part of. I have, I, I what I think of that decision isn't really even relevant here, but what I want to make very clear is that I have every confidence in our president and in our athletic director, who we hired and who we've delegated to be engaged and make these decisions. And what, you know, I can express my preference for whether we'd rather play or not, but I don't really think that's, as, as Regent Beeson said, part of the governance equation right now. And that's enough said. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Regent Shu, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, number one, the executive director does have a copy of this, um, so that should not be an issue. Uh, regarding board policy, this is not above our pay grade. Your interpretation, which we've been discussing on email, is perhaps in dispute uh, because you know, we do not have anything in our policies right now that delegates to the president uh, specific uh, duties related to the Big Ten. That probably is something that should be discussed and corrected. And I did ask Chair Powell, um, I believe a week or two ago, whether or not we were going to be able to do that. And um, he just said that, uh, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you basically said that uh, you guys have made a decision and that's that's where, where it is. So I think it's entirely appropriate to bring this uh, today, especially because there may be some meetings um, that we're, we haven't been made aware of. And in fact, it's, it's now 30 some days since, uh, well, about 30 days since the decision was made at the Big Ten. Uh, I was not informed as a board member, I was not informed that there was going to be a meeting. I was not informed of what um, was presented at the meeting. I was not informed um, at, or given access to any information about the health concerns that were raised in the meeting. And guess what? No one in the country was either. So uh, our president did not inform uh, the board as to what's going on in this. And I think that is a, a, a problem that we need to address as we go forward. And lastly, uh, the, the decision that was made, uh, there was supposedly a vote, but maybe there wasn't a vote. And then uh, last week they came out and said it was an 11 to three vote, but I have no idea how our president voted if, if there was a vote. So I think there's a lot of uh, questions about this and um, hopefully we'll be able to address them soon, but this is a very timely motion in that, uh, uh, the decision to return to um, some semblance of a fall schedule has not been made yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, so let me just uh, make a comment, and then uh, then we'll we'll uh, we'll move to the vote. First of all, I want all of my colleagues on the board to know, uh, uh, for myself and for Mr. Swigum, that I did not know that uh, this resolution was coming. I want to assure you, uh, I don't understand it, and I can't follow it. 
Uh, and from, so from a governance standpoint, uh, I, would, uh, I would refer back to uh, Regent Rocha's uh, uh, the way he's handled, uh, you know, I think his, his good questions on uh, urgent approval, where uh, everyone knew that he had those concerns. Uh, we had copies of his resolution. We knew it was coming in new business. And so it was very orderly. This one, I had no idea it was coming. And, um, and I can't really follow it. And to, uh, I think I would ag very much agree with Regent Mayron that it's, uh, to me, it's, it's just not good governance to, to move forward in that way. Second of all, in terms of the delegation of authority, um, I think it's, it's clear over time, very clear that this board has uh, left uh, Big Ten decision-making in the hands of our president. And this goes back many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, I made this point to uh, uh, Regent Hsu. Uh, uh, that was the case when the Big Ten network was formed, when media rights were negotiated, when the conference was expanded, uh, we've left uh, you know, the authority in the hands of the president, and it's really uh, always been part of the president's uh, uh, responsibilities. And um, uh, uh, I think a president who can't act uh, in that setting uh, uh, would be a president with very little impact or influence uh, in the Big Ten. And so I'm very, very supportive of the delegation of authority that we've been acting on for many, many, acting under, under, under many, many decades. So I strongly oppose this resolution and with that, I'll ask Mr. Steves to uh, call for the roll. And Mr. Chair, I'll simply, uh, before I do that, echo that uh, the board office, neither the board office nor I had any advanced knowledge of this. And I did receive a copy of it from Regent Shu at 136 after it had, after it had been moved and seconded. Okay, with that, let's call the roll. The Shu resolution. Uh, Regent Anderson. No. Regent Anderson votes no. Regent Beeson? No. Regent Beeson votes no. <laughs> Regent Davenport? No. Regent Davenport votes no. Regent Her? No. Regent Her votes no. Regent Shu? Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Mayron? No. Regent Mayron votes no. Regent McMillan? No. Regent McMillan votes no. Regent Rocha? Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum? No. Regent Swigum votes no. Chair Powell? No. Chair Powell votes no. Mr. Chair, there are three in favor and nine opposed. Okay, that motion is defeated. All right. Um, any other new business to come before the board? Hearing none, this meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned.